Hello, my fellow Estorians. We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you another episode of Trial by Theory. We were originally planning today to speak to you about Baylor the Blessed, but Baylor the Blessed will have to wait a bit longer. We had a sort of a last minute schedule change. Uh, Nina had something come up, not an emergency or anything. There's no reason for concern, but we did have to reschedule. And we'll announce that when the time comes. Luckily, thanks to you all, we had so many theories sent to us when we did our first trial by theory that we were pretty easily able to pivot to cover the rest of them. We normally might have had a little little struggle getting something done. We might, probably would have had to just not have an episode this week. But again, be due to your uh, great volume and quality of theory crafting, we have plenty to talk about. So... We appreciate that, that, and more on today's episode of History of Westeros podcast. Yes, everybody, we have lots of fun theories to discuss today. We had so many good ones sent to us, but we didn't have time for them all. What particularly excites me is that there's one in this list that I've been a huge fan of. It might be in my top five favorite theories, and oh, we're going to get to it. Oh, I don't know what it is, actually. It is ARIA-related, I'll tell you that. Oh, so, interesting. A little, a little teaser there. Hmm. Sean, uh, you've got a uh, Who Watches shirt on. It's a Stormtrooper and Who Watches the Troopers. <laughs> a Watchmen Star Wars mashup. That's right. Mm -hmm. They do wear masks. Rorschach face looks kind of Stormtrooper-y. That's right. And I've got The Gang Goes to Ice and Fire Con on my shirt, which combines... Three of my favorite things. <laughs> it's always sunny in Philadelphia, which is where the gang goat does. That comes from that. It's, of course, in the It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia font. Uh, a Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, and Ice and Fire Con. Three of my favorite things all Maybe together. Maybe four, too, because you like a good shirt. I do like a good shirt. I'm not <laughs> sure if it's quite as high as those other things on the list, <laughs> but it is certainly up there. I mean... <laughs> But yeah, we it's will. the way you portray those other things. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but we will be at Ice and Fire Con at the end of April. We will be doing a History of Westeros meetup. We will be doing two different quiplash sessions. Sean is doing a Song of Ice and Fire yoga, a bunch of different panels. And we'll talk more about that as the weeks get go on and we get closer to things. And we'll share a schedule of all of the History of Westeros events at the con. Yeah, we hope to see you there, and if not, we will discuss and report on what occurred. Actually, yeah. one thing about that, you might have seen in the Facebook group, but we are doing our Green Man cosplay again, where we <laughs> wear full Green Man suits, um, a la the Green Men of the Isle of Faces, and we run around. Last year, there were six of us, and we're on track to have more than six of us this year. So if you want to join, it costs like 20 bucks for the suit. So it's a really yeah, easy, I mean, cheap cosplay. Yeah, that's all it takes, 20 bucks yeah. for the suit. Like Obviously, you're not giving that money to us. No, yeah, but my <laughs> That's point just is, how much it costs to wear the suit. It's just a very easy, <laughs> to buy the cheap, suit. and s simple-to-pack cosplay because it's just a small green suit. I mean, yeah. So, you know, come join us. Yeah, another Sunny mashup, That's true. by the way. Yeah, the Green, Man, the Green Man costumes come from It's Always Sunny uh, lore, basically. Yeah, the Gang Gets Invincible <laughs> episode. And there's other episodes, but that's the most couple notable of them, couple yeah. episodes. Charlie often wears his Green Man suit. Green Man often <laughs> saves his life right now. And it saved my life, too. <laughs> Rob McElhaney, one of the, the four main guys in Sunny, also once hosted a panel on Game of Thrones. At, a, at which convention was it? It might have been even... I think it was San Diego Comic Con. It might have been Comic Con. Comic -Con. Yeah. yeah, I think and, he was the host for the San Diego Comic Con panel. And he opened the panel by saying, "If you all are wondering why they chose me to host this panel on Game of Thrones, I'm one of you." Like yeah. he's like, "I also <laughs> want to know why." Like, he didn't know either. But there is a long history of crossover of Game of Thrones, and it's always sunny. Those guys know each other. Yeah, the D and D were in. Always sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah, anyways, yeah. Uh, that's all. all and huge and they were in Game of and Thrones, they were in Game of Thrones right? Yeah, yeah. Were, yeah, exactly. Uh, so anyway, so that's trivia. That's all sorts of trivia in, in there. That's how we get started with some outside mm -hmm. trivia. But this episode was uh, voted on by patrons, not the second version of it, but the original version. Next week, we have Old Man of the North, Cregan Stark. That's also voted on by patrons. I will be on Girls Gone Canon. Uh, we're recording this week. The episode, I think, will be up of, of right after that. I guess at the beginning of... Right at the end of March, beginning of April. On Victorian, the Iron Suitor chapter. 
as you all know or probably know, I am a big fan of the Victorian chapters. I find them highly entertaining. I like so it should be you, good times. I like how you said that. I'm a big fan of the Victorian chapters. Not I'm a big fan of Victoria. You, you chose your <laughs> words very deliberately, I feel. <laughs> as all people who are fans of Victorian chapters must do. <laughs> Choose your words carefully. Yeah. Oh, he's a great guy. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure anyone would actually think that, even no matter what I said, but... <sighs> Yeah, it, proper wording is important, right? <laughs> we do have a trivia question in addition to the theories today. In cartoons and comedies, we often see the trope of someone sniffing pepper and then sneezing. Name the one person who does this in A Song of Ice and Fire. Aha, yes, there is a pepper sniffer sneezer in A Song of Ice and Fire, and I will reveal that answer at the end. Starting off, though, we have a pair of super chats from TKOK Podcast Network. He's like, I'm going first. I got super chats. I got theories. The first one is, is Balerion the cat inhabited by a human soul? So the idea is, why would we think this? Why would some cat have a human soul? Well, because this cat has consistently targeted the Lannisters. And Balerion the cat was owned by young Rhaenys Targaryen, daughter of Elia and Rhaegar, and was thus killed by uh, Amory Lorch, not Gregor Clegane. Gregor Clegane killed Elia and baby Aegon. Regardless of who the murderer was, the orders most certainly came from Tywin, so it makes sense that the cat would sort of haunt them. I like the idea that the cat has a human soul. I don't know. We can like I, it's kind of a headcanon that it's Rainey's in there. I think George wants us to think that or at least wants us to think that the cat is getting revenge on behalf of her former owner. Uh, it's not an accident. It's not just whoops. Somehow I accidentally wrote this cat hates the Lannisters. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we are supposed to get that vibe. And it's one of those things. Well, you know, it's an unanswerable question, but I'm gonna go with yes. I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna say yes. Why not? We've got wargs in this universe. Why not? I don't know why it's that much of a stretch. All cats have human souls. <laughs> <laughs> great point, Actually, great I point. think they have nine human souls in them. Ooh, <laughs> nine human souls. Shay has got the correct answer. Yeah. There. That's why this was a $9 super chat, too. Yeah, that's why we have 36 humans living in our house. <laughs> oh, God, no wonder. <laughs> that's why there's so much vomit. There's 36 humans worth of hairballs. and Anyway. All, his other <laughs> theory is, is it possible Rhaegar crossed the trident or crossed the river because other Targaryens had similar vision to Danny fighting others at the trident? This is a really interesting variation on the theories that we were discussing with regards to Rhaegar and his confidence. If you take Rhaegar's overconfidence as mystical, somewhat mystical, or at least mystically influenced via his destiny or what he believed to be his destiny, and we also take the idea that uh, prior Targaryens had dreamed of the dragons coming back or dreamed of the pyre that birthed the dragons that was that moment. Well, it's a really it's a really good idea because if he saw the vision that Danny saw, he would see himself winning. To push back against this a little bit, I would say that by the time Rhaegar crossed the trident, he already had abandoned the idea that he was the child, the chosen one. He had already moved on to thinking it was his son. Still, <laughs> for him, to, he would still be confident because if he loses, his son would, he would know that his son would die and all this other stuff. So he would still, there would still reasons for him to be confident, but we can't say it's confidence in himself being the chosen one, but still, or Azor High. Chosen one's the wrong term, but you know what I mean. I want to push back a little too on the idea of him being overconfident. Like sometimes, I mean, not to say he wasn't, but I just don't feel it's... Maybe just regular confidence. I don't assume that. Yeah. Like, for for example, just in general, a lot of times leaders have to portray confidence even mm. when they know there's issues or problems as part of being a leader. And aside from leadership, was Brienne overconfident when she said no chance, no choice and engage in that fight? Like, was she, does everyone think Brienne's this arrogant, overconfident warrior mm. who just, just assumed she was going to, no, she didn't assume she was going to win. She just knew she had to do, it's her duty. She's trying to do what she believed was right. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's fair to call that overconfidence. Okay. Well, I, I guess that's why I framed it if he was overconfident. So, or or yeah, if his yeah. overconfidence was mystically inspired. If he just had regular, oh, I could win overconfidence. That's, a, that's not really relevant to the dreams. But I see what you're saying. It's a strong point. Yeah. He doesn't have to have been overconfident. He may have just, well, this is our best chance. May as well project confidence. 
this looks worse than we think and we got to take our chance when it's best yeah there as we discussed in the episode there were a lot of reasons to think that it may have been circumstance and not overconfidence mm-hmm. that caused Rhaegar to cross and attack when he did Terra Incognita says, I finished reading Dunk and Egg for the first time last night. Well, that was pretty fast. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Must have really, I, I assume you enjoyed it. And, and maybe now you'll listen to the uh, Valar Arenas for Dunk and Eggs and uh, enjoy all that good time. We had, what did we did? 12 episodes plus a, a wrap up, I think. So 13 total. Nice lucky number. All right. Four for each. I mm-hmm. also would recommend, uh, I assume you just read the book, which is great and fine, but the audio version of uh, Harry Lloyd was. Maybe the best audio anything I've ever it's listened quite to. quite good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is really good. He, Harry Lloyd is awesome, I agree. And that's, of course, the actor who played Viserys in Game of Thrones, not House of the Dragon. <laughs> it's not, not Patty Considine. Which made me, hesitant, <laughs> made me hesitant going in. I was like, ah, oh, because you hate Viserys so much. <laughs> but Harry Lloyd has range. Go figure. He's a good actor. Yeah. And I, th- I really think it made me like Duncan Egg even more hearing his interpretation of it. Hell yeah. Uh, from Anna Farrick Davis. The creation of dragons caused an impact winter from the second moon crashing into the earth, creating the first long night and the screwed up seasons. They say, not my theory came from, I think, Wild Russie or something on Reddit? Well, it, it, Wild Russie may have come up with this on their own, but this is a very old theory. This theory has existed since A Clash of Kings. Uh, basically, when, or maybe even sooner. Uh, it existed as soon as Eri and Jiki made that point about dragon, uh, you know, second moon where dragons came from in ancient times. I forget if that's in Game of Thrones or Clash of Kings. People started theorizing that was the cause of the long night back then. So that this theory has existed since the 90s, uh, prior to any podcast existing or any even YouTube existing at all. <laughs> prior to Reddit existing. Prior to Reddit existing, yeah. So this, so again, not taking anything away from Wild Russie. Some people came up with this on their own without knowing about the prior versions of this theory. So not throwing shade or anything. But it does make sense that a planetary event... A moon exploding would cause a long-term planetary problem. <laughs> there would be there would be other effects rather than just ooh, look at that pretty thing up in the sky blowing up. That's a nice. It's like it's not just like fireworks, right? <laughs> I mean, if it were distant enough, maybe it would be. But a moon implies somewhat some proximity, and the gravity is is already in play on it. Thus, if the gravity was holding the moon in place, then the pieces of the moon would also be held and perhaps pulled even closer. So it definitely there's other things that would be impacted too, like yeah. the tides, for example, just the shifting of the, whatever established orbit a moon had. If it changes, it will affect the tides. It'll affect the seasons if it changes the tilt of a planet or the the if it goes to be more oval instead of a circular orbit around the sun. These are all things that would affect and especially if these things are like kind of out of whack after the first impact. Eventually, after millions of years, this sort of gravitational pulls stabilize but in the meantime there would be this unevenness that would cause uneven seasons yeah i agree yeah so it fits it does fit really well i mean you don't need this explanation because it can just be magic but magic could could have caused this the magic could have caused the second moon to explode right this these, these ideas are not mutually exclusive and i like it i mean it's it's a it's 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 epic grand scale magic but it fits really well for something like this it would be pretty wild i don't expect it to repeat like the other moon gets brought down to cause the second line like oh now we don't have any mm-hmm. moons <laughs> that's a, that might cause some issues like would there just not be any tides from that point on i don't know how tides work exactly but you just have just all the oceans will be just like as still as a pond boy what a weird i doubt yeah, martin's put this much thought into this type of thing but another impact like the moon going around earth churns the molten core mm. which generates a magnetic field which reflects solar rays that would otherwise strip away our atmosphere ah. so so we that's might not something have. else if the moon just went away that would be the end i mean it probably wouldn't happen like in two days it might take a while for the molten core to slow down and magnetic field to go away but uh, in the length of time that westeros has existed you know the length of time of a dynasty or whatever yeah the world would end that's some good science there sean (laughs) yeah you know i once we talked briefly a while back about having on uh, someone um with someone who's an expert in astrophysics and things like that to maybe hone in on some of these theories and and maybe add or subtract some some data or ideas from the from the genre of this particular theory uh continuing here we have Anna Farrick Davis's personal idea is that the Red Priest and Faceless Men caused the Doom of Valyria. 
The Red Priests have this prophecy won't come true unless the Targaryens go to Westeros. They killed hundreds of thousands to save millions in a few hundred years, which is fairly on target for the Red Priest sacrifices. And of course, fire is the purest death. I know it's tinfoil, but I haven't found anything to disprove it either. And Melisandre could be potentially old enough to have witnessed the doom in her lifetime. Yeah, Melisandre could be that old. It would make her 400-ish, which is pretty old. And I think more likely she's in the 1 to 200 range. But it is entirely possible uh, that she's that old. Now, I do believe the faceless men aspect of it. I'm not sure about the red priests. I think maybe they've prophesied it and, you know, given their flame reading and given how long they've existed and how visions work in this world, I would guess that some red priests have seen, saw the doom in, in advance. Maybe D D Danny's the Dreamer wasn't the only person who saw it, but... I mean, kind of don't that that by itself is a bit of a stretch that of all the people that can have dreams and visions of the future that only one person saw the doom, you know, mm. that that sounds like a stretch to me. So I can believe that Red Priest saw. I don't know about causing it, though. Yeah, whereas I definitely think the faceless men were involved in the doom of Valyria. Like there's yes, it's beyond headcanon to me, beyond theory. It's just what I, I regard as the facts. Um so to if we're talking about top five theories for like like uh, I, I feel like if i were to list if we were to do our terra incognita reminded me that we had intended to do a tier list for part two and we obviously this we scrambled to get this so we didn't do the tier list but for a part three and i think if i were to do a tier list faceless men causing doom of valeria is an s tier theory for me <laughs> yeah i totally agree s -tier, tier theory as well it and to be clear yeah we did pivot to this episode at about one in the morning yeah. <laughs> last night. So. Yeah. <laughs> we, but, go ahead, John. Let me ask you this, Shay, because you seem quite confident. Yeah. Do you think that they did it intentionally? Yeah, I sure okay. do. So here's the idea. I think that, yeah, the earliest faceless men forming was them wanting to, to stop these they're the masters, yes. The basic idea is that, yeah, we know, and George mentions it in the World of Ice and Fire, that Mystery is basically floated in the world of ice and fire. It's it's suggested by the maesters as a possibility that the sorcerers of Valyria, the blood mages, the fire mages, whatever genre you place them in, they were controlling the flames, the 14 flames in some way, drawing energy from it, doing whatever business they do with it. But they also, they were holding it in check. They were keeping it from erupting. And... One side theory to that is that it gets harder and harder to do that over time. Get the volcanic forces that you're holding back, get, the pressure gets larger and larger. So the intensity and the requirements of holding that back gets bigger and bigger. The idea is pretty simple. The faceless men are assassins, and they could target the very few sorcerers capable of holding back this f fury of the Earth. It would... And from an engineering perspective, it's not that difficult to conceive. Take out the very few people capable of holding this back and it all goes. It's like take out the dam and the whole, you know, it all, it'll take a few mm -hmm. chunks out of the dam. The whole dam collapses. The whole valley floods. That's it. All right. If there's only a few people that can do it, if there's only a few people that can do that, you kill those few people. That's it. Now, it's also floated that the houses of Valyria did that to themselves, that they their internecine struggles assassinating each other caused this problem but how would they like if the assassins got away with it you don't necessarily know which of them did it it could be both it could be a little of both and but of course the uh, faceless men are incredible perhaps the best assassins that we've ever heard of so maybe it makes some sense to give them put them higher on the list of possibilities if not highest it's a pretty good theory i think it's a reasonable theory but i think it's also possible that the especially because this is something else i feel like george has hinted at is it they just didn't realize what they were dealing with. Yeah. You know, they, it, it was more powerful than they understood or they went too far. And maybe you could even make a parallel to, you know, environmentalism, you know, yeah. if, effects of us mining oil I, out of the earth or whatever. I mean, I think you could, I think you can have both. Co like, yeah. I, I don't think they're yeah. mostly ex exclusive. Um, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, so maybe Sean puts it at, if we're if we were doing this tier list style, maybe Sean will put it B or A, not S tier. It's like not me. quite S tier for Sean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> S tier in Sean's case is Sean tier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so yeah, so it's pretty cool. There's a lot of there's a lot of juice around these ideas. These not just the main theory, but all the things that set it up, like the Valyrian sorcerers and whether they were actually holding this energy back or if y'all are interested in more on that. Up. 
our Doom of Valyria episode is, is quite good, I think. And yeah, it, covers uh, it. It, it, did, it does reference some of this stuff directly, and it's one of our shorter episodes. It's only about 45 minutes, but it's a scripted one. Mm-hmm. And also shout out to the uh, Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. Each book in that trilogy won the Hugo, which is... Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, whoa. Each book, yeah. <laughs> All three of them individually won <laughs> it, and it deals with tectonic plates, volcanoes, moons, just geological magic yeah. and apocalyptic stuff. Imagine that if this stuff was in a cycle. It's it's so good. It's so mm. good. Anyway, and it's being adapted for TV, and N.K. Jemison is the showrunner. <laughs> She's like, mm-hmm. no, I'm not letting someone else do it. I'm doing it. <laughs> like, we see what <laughs> happens when other people – adapt other people's work now we're not doing that i'm doing it she's doing it herself so it won't be anytime soon i'm guessing but yeah (laughs) hopefully before 2030 (laughs) hopefully before we have a truly broken earth (laughs) yeah before before the real earth breaks yeah (laughs) chris green sends a super chat says baylor tried to make the faith of the seven honored in all seven kingdoms of the north resisted leading to a trial by combat between cregan and aemon oh that's kind of cool that would fit that would fit after all we are wondering when Cregan and Eamon had a duel and why. And it, it, it's such a wide range of time it could have happened over. So that is kind of cool. I like the idea. One of the ideas we're going to talk about when we get to the Baylor episode is whether is his view on trial by combat, whether he, because he was such a pacifist, George wrote that Baylor would have disarmed everyone if he could have. His only, his favorite weapon was prayer, <laughs> you know, and he was kind of, tongue in cheek with that but he really did he was like ultra pacifistic so i'm not even sure baylor would be down with trial by combat but if he was okay with any form of combat it would be this because it reduces the combatants to just a couple rather than throwing the whole realm into war which yeah that is better you know if you're if you have to decide it through violence make it as few people as possible i I think (laughs) that's probably a good point um Jordan Reynolds says, Aegon V learns of the Conqueror's prophecy, and as you would expect of Egg, devotes himself to bringing back the dragons as he believes they are necessary to save the world. The fire is a way for Egg, Dunk, and Duncan the Small to escape and head east to find secrets and possible avenues of bringing the dragons back, eventually leading to the three, egg, three eggs being given to Danny. Now, <clears throat> Yandel says... Aegon V wanted dragons because, quote, as one defiance followed another, his grace found himself forced to bow to the recalcitrant lords more often than he wished. A student in history and lover of books, Aegon V was oft heard to say that he only had, that had he only had dragons, as the first Aegon had, he could have remade the realm anew with peace and prosperity and justice for all. Well, first of all, would he really, (laughs) would it really be peace and, it might be under his reign it might be, but then when it passes to, the people that follow, like the people that followed Aegon the Conqueror, the second, the second of whom was Magor the Cruel. Like that guy used dragons to, and he didn't make it peace and prosperity and justice for all. Now, did he? But he sure had the dragons. So yes, Egg could have done this. Uh, but he let's let's look at this bit about him being a student of history and lover of books. This is, I think, a, a key to the whole thing, to either side of the of the debate or other sides of it, which is what he read or and or dreamed that made him want to do all this in addition to just thinking of it as a tool to solve his problems like on the very basic level the lords bucked his trends he wanted to make the realm uh more progressive shall we say he wanted to take power away from the lords and give more to the commons something that i think a lot of us would immediately get behind if not like way way behind like well, way, way in front of behind. Yeah. <laughs> in the front of the line behind Aegon V. And, but, of course, you could obviously see why the lords would be against this. They would be like, no, we're not, don't take power away from us. And they're the ones that have the power, so it's hard to take it away from them. Right? It's easier to give someone power than to take it away from someone who already has it. That's just a general truth of power in, in all forms. So, but, but at the same time, if he's looking at these old books... Is he looking at prophecy books? Is he reading whatever Aegon the First wrote about the prophecy? If it was still there to be read, given Baylor may have burned it, or was he having dreams of his own? 
I, I'm not down with the escaping East part to do more research on their own. Although I am open to the idea that he sent representatives to do that for him. One theory is that he sent Shiera Seastar to do that, or that she had gone on her own to do that. Maybe they had communication because she could still have been alive at this time. No problem. Um, and in general, looking for ways to bring the dragons back. Yeah. I mean, he was doing that. I mean, he tried it. It didn't work. So we know that part, that part tracks. Uh, and I don't think Duncan the Small was involved. I think he wanted nothing to do with any of this <laughs> other than to still be included in the family. Say, so, hey, they're all going to Summer Hall. I'm going too, you know. Oh, well, now I'm blown up. <laughs> Oops. Should have really stayed away from so, the family. <laughs> well, one thing we talked on the last uh, theories episode, if, if you didn't see it, maybe even if you did, it's worth bringing up again. Like, there's a few sort of factors you use to evaluate a theory. And, you know, anyone can come up with any theory they want. We don't want to hold you back. But if, you know, if we're going to take it more seriously, there's got to be like some amount of evidence for it in the book. That's one thing you need. Uh, another thing you need is for it to have some meaning or impact on the story. Like, why would George bother for this to be a thing? And so sometimes maybe he wouldn't, but it's like head cannon you could have. And that's kind of like being fun. You know, but it's got to it's got to be interesting or fun or whatever for the theory to be worthwhile. And then uh, what was it for? We had like four things. What was the other one? Uh, I think um, there was only three. Oh, there's got to be a way for it to be revealed. Oh, there's got to yeah, be one, okay. some way for it to come to fruition sure. in the story, you know. Good point. Um, so anyway, one of my thoughts about this one, if you're just thinking about if this fits all those, it kind of fits the fun category because yeah. you don't want Egg and Dunk to be dead, right? Yeah. That's the reason you would have this theory. You want there to be some way for them to be And you want them to be more but, heroic um, too. You don't want Egg to yeah. have... Yeah, it's pretty tragic the way the whole thing goes. And, it, and yeah. especially if it's, since it implies that Egg may have had some dark like yeah. some darkness I mean, behind all this i want the tragedy i don't think i want the you know yeah i mean especially if the tragedy is for some greater good like we don't know the details like to be clear anyone who's knows or has read any duncan egg there's three novellas but he planned like 12 and we just know from history that egg ends up dying in a fire but we don't know none of the novellas get into how or why that happens it's not even close right he's still like a kid so. yeah um but um anyway uh some problems with this are that what is egg escaping from? Why does he need to escape to the East? Yeah. Well, you know, like he could he, go, he just, if he's the go king. to the East. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't need to fake. And like, death. yeah. Then does he have to have this fire that kills a bunch of innocent people yeah. in order to escape or to study this? Like, I, I don't know. I just said too much of this goes against what would make sense. I think. Yeah. But, I think he, I think he's a kid. If he wants to go East as a King, he can just do that. Yeah. I mean, it would be unusual. It would be highly unorthodox, but yeah, he could do it. Like burning your family in a fire is also unusual in an Orthodox. I guess. <laughs> it's less unusual yeah. for a Targaryen. I, <laughs> I, I do want to point out, even though I'm picking his theory apart a little bit, that Jordan Reynolds, uh, he's the one that's working on a soundscape. Yeah. Like, you know, background music and audio bits to fit. He's, I think he's working or maybe even done with Lord of the Rings yes. and working on Game of Thrones. And he did a 10 hour uh, live stream yesterday featuring the music. I tuned in for a little bit and uh, I didn't know that. Oh, you know, I think maybe it's somewhere in the back of my mind. I did know this from 10 years ago, but but they were someone has built like the Lord of the Rings world in Minecraft. Yeah. yeah. And so they were using that as visuals for the YouTube stream. Well, there's also that for yes. uh, Westeros. Oh, yeah. Westeros Craft, Westeros Craft yeah. is like incredible. Anyone just, just Google Westeros Craft or whatever. And there's like a bunch of little videos of the Minecraft world that they made the castles our, and the land. Our hand of the king so, for many many years was cash craig who was deep into that group of of the minecraft uh, i don't i don't know if he's still involved with it but he it was part of his nickname part of his uh, patreon title was lord of mines or something like that yeah i can't remember exactly mm, off the top of yeah. My head, but yeah it was definitely a minecraft reference that's really cool yeah he, he was talk to me about how impressive it all was and that was years ago and i'm sure it's now it's even more impressive because it's just it's still going yeah, it's I can't imagine the incredible expertise and time and and it's the organization. <laughs> and, like, how do you get it? Yeah. Like, how did like one person's over here building this and like who told them to do that? And how are they? And, how do we know they're doing it? Right, quote unquote, right. And, yeah. I don't know. And making it match up. And, yeah. yeah. But anyway, they did it and it's beautiful. So, yeah. Shout out to them. Yeah. And so Jordan, he, his soundscape. I love the idea of a soundscape for for reading. Uh, music just adds so much to well to anything pretty much so and this is includes not just music but apparently it will include things like sounds like 
nature rain sounds, or rain, maybe barking even. howling wolves or yeah exactly yeah. depending on the chapter and things like that so it's a really good idea really good thing really good companion i love the idea so we'll keep you all up to date on that when there's uh, updates to be had Next up, we have Josh Sandlin saying, Jerry and Lannister is the Shrouded Lord. This is a fairly popular theory. It's been around a bit. I think uh, I've heard it from a few places. And Jerrion, of course, the how is this possible would be that Jerry and Lannister did go off in search of the Lannister treasures like Bright Roar in, in the ruins of Valyria. He took an expedition there. Tywin thought it was a bad idea. I think Tywin was probably right. And... <laughs> Uh, but he did, you know, support his brother enough, like financially, like, so it wasn't, you know, he wasn't just going to sail off in a decrepit sinking ship, but why is, is a question here. Why would Jerry and Lannister want to become the shrouded Lord? Why would he become a pirate? I think that if he wanted to set himself up as some sort of pirate captain, some sort of pirate Lord, this is pretty small potatoes. The shrouded Lord sounds cool. Sounds dangerous, but as Illyrio says, the river pirates are basically cockroach pirates because there's no real, there aren't real prizes on the rivers. There aren't like big fat ships full of loot. You you see smaller craft that are shipping food up and down. And sure, sometimes there's there's fancy goods on board, but the real trade goods, the really valuable stuff, goes really far because. It's more valuable the farther you ship it. You can pay more, get more for it. The farther, the more exotic it is. The, the, the more exotic the market, the more wealth in this market, the more demand there is farther away. The more surcharge you can put on it for shipping it so far. Things like that. You can carry, ocean faring vessels carry more than river vessels. That too. too. You're right. Just the sheer amount of cargo. Very good point. Like look at the vessel that, that they were sailing in on the river there. It was a river craft. It was small. Like they had some stuff. And think about what, they were how they communicated. Remember when the two ships passed each other? They were like, Kingfisher, you know, and they yelled their cargo out. Like, I, Needles was like on the head, like little, like, not that's, you don't, I don't think pirates are excited about a, a crate of needles, you know? I mean, that's useful, but they're not going to retire on that. They're like, yes, needles. We, <laughs> that's exactly what I was hoping for. <laughs> like, nails, that's what we needed. Yeah, no, they're the, the big treasures out on the open sea. And so for someone who's a Lannister, you know, if he's going to turn pirate, this just seems kind of small potatoes for him, you know. Um, but it would be cool because Tyrion was there and it would have been neat for him to have this almost encounter with his uncle. So it, it definitely checks off the fun boxes. And it, it, it's it's cool that the uh, that this character is like a Dread Pirate Roberts where it's had many identities. So it could definitely have been taken over by someone else. But yeah, there's a few. There's nothing that clearly say. disproves it. There's nothing that makes it impossible to be the case, but it doesn't necessarily make sense to be the case. Yeah. Also, Halden Halfmaster says the current Shrouded Lord is a Corsair from the Basilisk Isles, which he could be wrong. It could be a new Corsair. It could be a new person could have taken them over. But Jerrion would have been like 15 years prior to that. So if Halden has information on who the current one is then it kind of can't be Jerry unless this person also somehow faked their, which, which why, why would they bother to do that? I don't know that it, Jerry concealing his identity also isn't like, why I don't get, I mean, maybe because the shrouded Lord is the shrouded Lord. And if you're the shrouded Lord, you can't be who you used to be. But I don't know. I feel like a Lannister pirate would be, would, would carry more weight than just him being the next shrouded Lord. <laughs> if he just called yeah. himself what he is, I'm the laughing lion. It's, it fits in with the Jolly Roger, right? <laughs> <laughs> he could change his name to Roger from Jerrion. Rogerian. Yes, that's a good That's a good George R. R. Martin style name. Slightly similar to a real world name. Rogerian. Yes. That's going to be my new name online somewhere. Okay. Uh, next one. Unless you all had any other comments on that one. John Ravenscroft from our Facebook group says, ooh, this is going to be fun. I submit did Oberyn poison Tywin. I can see the series ending with no definitive answer. There's been lots of debate. There's some points and counterpoints out there. Uh, Nina's take on this one is that it's another example, not the only, but one of many examples of Tywin's, to use Nina's words, moral rottenness, which is displayed on things like the cat hating him, right? There's all other things, the animals, his own body, nature, everything rejects Tywin because he's a bad guy. <laughs> he's villainous and 
and unethical and whatever words you want to throw, whatever criticisms of his person you can throw. I still, it is possible. I don't, I don't throw it out because there is plenty to suggest the possibility. Oberyn's a poisoner. Oberyn wanted Tywin to die, but Oberyn also wanted Tywin to see everything fail. He wanted him to suffer and see all his works collapse before he died. He not just kill him and be done with it. He wanted it to be slow and painful and not just physical pain, but failure. He wanted to see the works of Tywin Lannister reduced to some ruin, which Doran Martell pretty much said. <laughs> and Oberyn and Doran, it's implied on this one thing, they were very much together because they, they definitely both wanted to wreck Tywin. Maybe they had a few different ideas on how to do it. But yeah, I, I think this is a decent theory, but I do lean towards no because of it doesn't really speak to the methods that Oberyn and, and Doran wanted to take Tywin down with. What do you think, uh, Sean, on that one? Uh, yeah, I think usually when you hear someone was poisoned or using poison, da, 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 usually it's to kill them. But maybe it was a mild poison. It's made him kind of sick and uncomfortable. Yeah. Maybe it slowed his cognition down. Or his or, bowel or, you know, something right. like that. that was, that's, that's an yeah, existing yeah. poison we've seen. Like T T Tyrion wanted to give that to Cersei. Or did give that to Cersei, yeah. actually. <laughs> so I... um. It it seems like it would be something that would be hard to get revealed. Yeah, that's true. Time was dead. Oberyn's dead. Like, who, who would know about this? How, how would they, someone that did know, who would they tell? What would the context be? What point would it make? What difference would I it make? I guess Varys you know? or someone maybe could be aware of it. I mean, yeah, because Oberyn didn't, wouldn't yeah. have done the poisoning directly. I don't think he put the poison in Tywin's. Like, everybody knows he's a poisoner. Like, he's the first person they're going to. That's the other thing, by the way, is it's a little too obvious. Remember, that's what Tywin, that's what Oberyn said to T T Tyrion. He's like, it's a little too obvious, isn't it? He's like, everyone's going to blame me. Like, so he, and he yeah. knows that right away. So he's like, well, why would I do the thing that everyone's just going to automatically assume I did anyway? <laughs> it's like, everyone's going to point the finger at the poisoning Dornishman who hates Tywin Lannister. So maybe that's an art. I think it's a pretty strong argument against it too, because it's, it's what they expect Oberyn to do. Even he knows it. So on the other hand, if he were to do it and there was no proof, he's a prince. What are they going to do to him? We're like, I, you got no proof. I didn't, you know. <laughs> but I think he kind of wanted them to know it was him, too, though. <laughs> like, the way he did the trial by comedy, he's, like, pointing his finger, like, Tywin, you know, this guy, like, Eliamar, you know, he's just yelling all this stuff. He wanted it to be public. So that's another, I guess that's another strike against it, is the public nature of their goals here doesn't really imply a secret murder. Unless, again, he was just mildly poisoning him, not poisoning yeah. him to death. He might he so, might mildly poison him just as a him joke. Yeah. yeah. But then publicly still get to humiliate him. Yeah, I could see that maybe. Maybe a lot of risk in that one, just poisoning him just to make him feel uncomfortable. If you get caught, that looks... Like, no, I wasn't going to kill him. I was just trying to make him uncomfortable. <laughs> On the <laughs> other hand, Oberyn probably not too worried about any of that. He's not really worried about consequences. <laughs> I mean, this is the guy that's like, yeah, I'll fight the mountain. Definitely. <laughs> so <laughs> I think about that sometimes too, by the way. It's a little bit of a tangent, but like in that fight, like if the mountain hadn't like, if he hadn't been arrogant enough for the mountain to defeat him after all, yeah. how, how would that have played out? The mountain's dead. Oberyn's standing there accusing Tywin. Yeah, where and would it then, go from there? What? You're right, yeah. He just like, okay, bye, I'm going back home. And Tywin just lets him go back home. Go like, does the... he get arrested? Yeah. Does he... War breaks out? I mean, I yeah. don't know. Are yeah. there six guys in the audience that are going to jump out with poison daggers? <laughs> and, you know, I have a coup right there. Yeah, it's like, it's, like, it's like the TV show, a bunch of people with brazen beast masks just appear as if from nowhere yeah. <laughs> and start murdering just everyone for no reason. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to kill spectators, yeah, just for the hell of it. Like, yeah. That makes sense. Here's another theory that makes a lot of sense. Ashton Johnson, shout out to um, uh, to you, Ashton, for being our logo person. Yes, <laughs> that is Fox and Brambles. Fox and Brambles. Check out Fox and Brambles uh, for some great shirts and stickers and on, good stuff. That's on Etsy and Redbubble. Yeah. I'll drop a link in the chat. How good idea. That? So the idea is there's two, three theories here. The Night Lamp theory, the Daenerys Pyre having an echo through time, and the coming conquest of Karth. Now, the Night Lamp theory we discuss in our Battle of Ice series. So I can direct you to that one. Shout out to, oh, shoot, what's his name? Who came up with it? Anyway, I cite them in what? the Night Lamp theory. Oh, okay. Is that Cantus? Yes, it's Cantus. Okay, yes, yeah. that's right. Thank you. Good memory, Ashea. And the idea is that the watchtower that Stannis is camped at is being used 
to lure the Frey army into a trap. And this is very similar to On the Ice, which, yeah, like we've, this is, a, it's a good theory because it does seem to fit with exactly what's happening. And the reason it's called the Night Lamp Theory is because this is what the, the wreckers do, the sister men and real life wreckers, which is you light a false light to make it look like a lighthouse to lure ships onto the rocks and the ships wreck and you then pilfer the wrecked ships of whatever doesn't sink. Uh, so very similar idea here. You lure them with a false light and then they crash and die and, and drown. Uh, so uh, that one uh, pretty much headcan. And it really does seem like exactly what Stannis is doing. He's luring. He's like, I will turn the ground to my advantage. You know, <laughs> with this place isn't defensible. He says yet, you know, <laughs> all this stuff. and he's like, why are we leaving? Like I've got plenty, you know, so it, it's hard to imagine anything else too. It's like, what other thing could he put planning on an ice lake? A party? I mean, yeah. I think it's pretty. I think it's almost straightforward when you lay it all out. It, not just because it it's, fits really well. Stannis is a tricky commander. He likes traps, and because there's just nothing else that anyone's floated that I've seen remotely approaches fitting all these uh, items into one concise idea. So, yeah. Uh, the second part. Daenerys is power having echo through time. Dreams of War. This is a very big topic that I think we're going to discuss. Probably devote a whole episode to at some point. So we'll just do a brief version of it here. Absolutely. I totally believe it. I mean, why not? We've seen so many examples of Targaryens dreaming of the dragons returning. And that's the moment they come back. So why wouldn't they? So the idea of them seeing the moment or seeing the person of seeing, especially if her hair is gone, that which enables it to be seen. Uh, like it might look like egg in someone's vision or if you or... see before her hair is gone and it's just from behind and you can't tell it's just long hair that could be anyone like that's a lot of different possibilities uh it's a dream or a vision so already it's you know rife with loose visions and like things that you can't interpret properly and inconsistencies and imperceptible nuance things like that so i think it's i love this idea and uh, shout out to former me for at first being like, nah, this is, and then having like five minutes later, having a, the full idea after the full idea was explained, was like, actually, yeah, that's a really good idea. <laughs> I think it was uh, Joe Magician and maybe Amanda who, who first introduced me to the idea, Amanda Crowfood's daughter. I'm not sure, but that sounds right. Sounds like something they would do. The coming conquest of Karth. This one is uh yeah it's a little different because you might think karth is done in terms of the story like what point does it have in the story anymore it almost like it, it's it sort of was a side trip by georgia georgia originally planned for danny to go all the way to ashai so karth would have just been like on the way but he changed his mind for whatever reasons as much as he expanded the story he cut back on that which is interesting for sure so her journey ended at Karth. She didn't go any farther east than that. Any further eastward journey is going to be through journey, through her mind, through visions, through other people. Melisandre, Quaith is perhaps the most obvious uh, pr participant in that. But who else would conquer Karth? The Dothraki or the the Vol Volantines with their ships, but they're probably going to get destroyed anyway <laughs> by Daenerys if Daenerys wants to go back to conquer Karth because she saw how corrupt and awful it was I don't think she has time for that I mean I think she, if she I think she's probably going to die in Westeros and not have a chance to come back to Karth so if there's other ideas on the conquest of Karth from other parties I'd be curious about that and I certainly think it could happen I mean it's a very wealthy place and it the surrounding country that they used to control is just desert now so their power isn't what it once was so I could definitely see it. It's going to happen. They're they're not. They're uh, forgotten and tired <laughs> as a society, and very too corrupt to hold themselves up by their own weight in the long term. But I don't. I don't think it's part of this story. But I do think it's going to happen at some point in the future. <laughs> this place is this this city's going to fall apart by its own weight of dudes sitting on the throne of a thousand thrones or whatever, and every single like. There's literally a thousand people in the city that don't touch the ground with their feet because they are too proud and 
it's been this way for forever and yeah that can't last <laughs> even though it has lasted for quite a while uh christina wood says the time traveling fetus theory just kidding <laughs> that is one of the <laughs> most enduring funny theories uh, do you think there will be a Knights King and maybe some commentary on show versus book creation of the others? Now, of course, Christina means not like the show Night King. We all know there isn't a show night book version of the Night King in the show, but there is, of course, a Night King legend, and that legend could come back around again in the form of a character in the current story who fulfills a lot of the same qualities of the Night King. There are t only two candidates, really, in my mind. They are Jon Snow and Stannis. And they both check off, or could check off, a lot of the boxes of what the Night King legend says, which is the Night King uh, f to saw be clear, a What's that? I would like you to say Night's King. Oh, yeah, Night's King, sorry. Not Night King. Night, you're right. Night King is show version. Night's King is, is book version. You're, good correction there by okay. Shea. Night's King... Uh, saw a woman atop the wall from atop the wall and even though she was part other or something or part wilding part other and he married her and loved her and their children were this and that and he and she ensorcelled him and obviously that's not a direct quote but that's the basics of it so that already kind of sounds like what melisandre has done to stannis through a certain lens i mean it's obviously not quite nearly that simple and it says controlled the watch. Okay, so he's kind of did. He is kind of controlling the watch. He's not telling them what to do, but he is throwing his weight around quite a lot. He locked them in a room until they voted on their new Lord Commander. He didn't make them make the choice. He didn't pick a certain person, but he forced them to decide. Things like that. He demanded castles and things like that. John pushed back against him. So it's definitely not that he's just conquered the wall. He is being aggressive and forceful and demanding, but he's not fully, he hasn't taken over fully. John, on the other hand, might be literally undead and also, which you could say, ensorcelled by a woman because if Melisandre is the one who brings him back, then yeah, that makes sense. So I think that's what Night King, Night's King in the book is, is a legend about some distant person in the past, probably a Stark, as Old Nan says, which is also a lean towards John, that has the game of historical telephone has added magic and all these other lost details that make it f seem like history is repeating itself now in the form of maybe even maybe even both why not both why not Stannis and john it doesn't have to be one figure and oh, it could be multiples i i would like to add that aside from the night king and the knight's king and the differences between them and the legends of the history and et cetera et cetera I could still see there being some sort of leader of the White Walkers. Yeah, like if, sure. If, if that's going to be this foe that arises, if some sort of physical conflict between the Night's Watch or Stannis and zombies from a, beyond the wall or whatever happens, maybe they're all just mindless hordes running like zombies, but maybe they're some sort of leader. And whatever name you want to give them, you know, I think that's the, the Night King role from the show is the leader of the, yeah, the zombies. I and I think that. George might have that. Like a head might other, call it something different. Other, but, or at least yeah. the alpha. It doesn't have to be like a leader, just the biggest, strongest one. Like the, the yeah. way like wolves decide who's in charge, you know. Yeah. It isn't necessarily like they um giving whatever orders, sort but of, it leads the others yeah. follow. It's a pack. whatever sort of structure they have. Yeah. Uh, they probably aren't if they have any they're not a democracy, if, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, some sort of hierarchy or a leader. Yeah, like that. I I agree with you. It would be difficult to imagine that there just is. They're all equal, identical. That doesn't make sense. Like yeah, that I I agree with you. There's there's probably some sort of dominant one, even if leader isn't necessarily the right word. It could be. It could be. Do you think Euron isn't at all a candidate for that? You said you think of two candidates: Jon Snow and Stannis. Uh, yeah, I guess Euron could be because in a sense, you're right, actually. I don't okay. think Euron will be going to the wall, yeah. but I think he could fulfill some of that by maybe being the one that court darkness <laughs> brings it down yeah. or helps the others, <laughs> enables them and sort of leads them to the other side. So in a sense, he leads them to do more destruction. Even if he is not their leader, he enables something that they are lacking he without him. The so night. He, he Yeah, the night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he would be a king and he would be a knight's king. Yeah, so that makes sense. Also, actually, no, it's clearly the show knight king 
is clearly the armorer from Mandalorian. They have the little <laughs> <laughs> she has the little divots sticking up on top like that, you know. What about Benjamin Stark? Do you think he's possible at all? Oh, Benjamin Stark is the uh, I don't think so. Okay. I don't because the whole the whole story of the Night King is taking over, you know, is is, in, is being in charge and I don't see Benjamin like coming back and taking over, doing any sort of leading, just mm. besides maybe helping Bran or something like that, which isn't really leading the Night's Watch at all. So yeah, I don't I don't think so. Hmm. As those were for people in the chat, by the way, what's were, that? Those that was from people in the chat who were oh. curious because you had said so definitively two people, but there were those other two candidates that. Right on. Yeah, that's a good point to bring those up. Those are worthy mentions for sure. Also, Christina wanted us to talk about maybe some commentary on show versus book creation of the others. I think it's pretty similar. I think what we saw on the show with was the, the besides the not the dragon glass part of it sticking that into their heart. I'm not so sure about that part, the specific mechanism, but. The basic idea of children of the forest creating with others from captive humans. Yes. Yes. I don't think the show made that up. I think they got that from George. Um, but it but it could be more. I mean, the, how and I think it's going to be cooler the way they made them. It's going to be a little darker. And Nina Might suggests that be... they are like their spirits brought from another dimension to inhabit human mm -hmm. bodies, maybe. Or maybe not, because they're not human bodies. They're definitely not human bodies in the book. That's one thing we have to throw out a little bit. Maybe they evolved into that after being used as a human body. Because they're more, the way they're described, they're not particularly human. They are bipedal. They have, you know, two arms and two legs. But they're unnaturally thin and tall and ghostly, ghost-like. And I'm not sure, like, they're more yeah, altered. I think they were just, yeah, I think they're just transformed. I think they yeah. still came from a human. They could, yeah, you could say they st they came from a human, but the, the transformation is a lot more dramatic than what you see in the show. In the show, they're clearly former human. They just have too many yeah. human qualities, or at least they look really human. They, maybe not clearly former human, but they're they're, they're clearly played by human actors. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Whereas no... the book version doesn't sound doesn't sound particularly human. It just sounds like humanoid. Fairy -like. But... Yeah, humanoid. Yeah, humanoid. Yes, yeah. that's more like it. Yes, good word. So. Yeah, so there is some differences there, and yeah, maybe they're dead green seers brought back to inhabit human bodies, like the way Second Life works with animals or inside an animal's body, but this is instead of inside of an animal's body, it's inside of a human body, inside of a dead human's body that over time transforms. I don't know. It's pretty cool. I like, I like when there's a little bit of logistics behind the magic, but not so much that you don't keep the mystery. Like I love, I love the works of Brandon Sanderson. He's an example of someone that often just like flat out tells you how everything works, which I think is, eh, I don't mind that, but I prefer the mystery element to be as well. I like, I like a little half and half, I guess, <laughs> but your mileage may vary. I like if there is an explanation for it to make sense. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if they make an attempt to explain it and I try to pick holes at it and I can't, that's really good. And that's really hard to do with magic, you know? Right on. I would be so curious for Sean's reactions to some Brandon Sanderson, actually. I think there's some things you'd really like because he does get into like some logistical things a lot. I'd be curious. We'll, we'll find out one day when it's actually adapted to the screen. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of yet another thing that's getting adapted, right? <laughs> Stormlight Archive is only on book three out of or four out of ten. And they're all, you know, the hardbacks are. Oh. I'm making a picture with my fingers right now. Those of you <laughs> listening to show the size of these books. <laughs> they're huge. Uh, Shiera Seastar from our Facebook group. Hey, Shiera, how you doing? The question is, dead or alive? Ashara, Taisha, and Rayella. And why not Shiera Seastar herself? Throw, I'll, I'll throw that one in. <laughs> dead, 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 dead. Yeah, they're probably all dead. dead. Ashara is, I'm big on Ashara being dead. I don't I don't think it makes much sense for her to be alive. I don't. Big on Ashea being alive and Ashara being dead. <laughs> yes, Ashea is alive, and I, and I hope she stays that way for a very long time. Ashar, I do believe, is dead. I don't think I don't think George is it doesn't feel like that kind of setup where like, aha, she's alive because she could do what? Like, what's she going to what's the purpose of her being alive? Um, why would she fake her own death? Yeah, what would the point be? You know, uh, for the lulls, for the lulls. Yeah. yeah. To, to go hide at Greywater Watch. She's just a silly <laughs> little gal. She just wanted to go hide. That's it. Now, Taisha, I could see being alive. She's the most likely of these ones to be alive. Like, it hasn't been that long. She wouldn't be very old. She's about Tyrion's age. Tyrion's, what, 30? 
30? I think he's 30 now. 32? Yeah, he's about to be. He was 26 at the beginning of the books. Okay, so he should be 29-ish or 30. So show, so should she. She's about yeah. the same age. I'll tell age. you, I know that because it was, a real, it was a real milestone for me when I was like, oh, wow, I started this book series and I was much younger than Tyrion Lannister and I'm now <laughs> years older than Tyrion Lannister. <laughs> and that's what I love about him. I get older and he stays the same age. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it would be better if it was the other way around. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. No, it was, it was weird. I was like, he's baby to me. Before he was like an old, like a, a, an adult. Like I was like, he's the adult figure to me and now he is like a, a young man and and it's it's weird how your perspective changes that's yep. true yeah you're right that is yeah i mean just the way we even even without taking into account aging just the way like we view certain actions of characters like i've been in this fandom long enough to see the difference in Tyrion's a great example yeah. of how Tyrion's been viewed like Tyrion used to be like the second or third most popular character period now not so much. There's a lot more like looking at his flaws and being like, why do we laugh at some of these things? These aren't funny. Like some of the things he does is kind of evil. Yeah. And I don't, I'm, I don't I go so far tragedy, as to say he's evil. Though. Like I, I haven't gone that far. Some people have like, oh, Tyrion's just the worst. You know, he's, yeah, no, he's, he's, he's like, I don't think that it's definitely all. come around from like Tyrion is the best to Tyrion is the worst to Tyrion is flawed. And you can feel comfortable being a Tyrion fan. I, yeah. I would put him in my top three, four, four, you know, characters. So still, but I have never considered myself to be like a good guy, Tyrion apologist type of guy, like type yeah. of, I call myself guy there, but a type of person. <laughs> Uh, and that's nothing compared to Tywin. Tywin used to be, you used to see a lot of Tywin defenders. A oh, lot. Yeah. You don't see them so much anymore. I think just the, the over and over, just people hammering away and just pointing out Tywin's flaws, especially just showing what a bad father he is. I think that's something that is really emphasized more in 2023. And, you know, not just 2023, but starting, I don't know when exactly. But in the 90s, in the past couple generations, yeah, in yeah. the 90s, people, it just wasn't as much of the part of the public conversation, just how what how, the quality of parenting, right? People did recognize the quality of Ned's parenting and Catelyn and things like that. Like that did stand out. But Tywin's parenting wasn't criticized nearly as much as it should have been. Or it was written off as, OK, so that's his negative side. But he also does this well and this well. It's like over time. Tywin's become one of the biggest villains in the series, which I think is more correct. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I think another factor for that, uh, and, and a lot of these characters of this story or whatever, it's because we tend to pay more attention to or talk about or judge the screen time that they get. Mm. Does that make sense? And so when Tywin is on page explaining to Cersei the flaws in her logic, we're like, yeah, Tywin gets this. But we don't get it on screen when he commanded the genocide of a people. That's you know true. what I mean? That's, That's not true. on screen. It's this story from the past and we don't get exposed to it very often. But the more time we spend thinking about and analyzing and rereading this story, that becomes more and more a part of who he is. And when he's on screen, you know, squabbling with Tyrion in the back of our minds, we're like, this guy's a mass murderer. You don't have to listen to him. Like, <laughs> at least for me anyway. And like you, at least anything he says, you got to take it with a grain of salt. Like probably you should be arresting him and not like feeling bad because he put you in your place, you know? Mm, yeah. And I think that maybe is the nature of this book, maybe an advantage of Martin taking so long to get the next one out is because we do go back and reread it and reanalyze it and reevaluate it. So our opinions grow and change. To be fair to people who defended Tywin back then, one of the things that they would point out as a quality that they admire about him is his, his administration skills. But over time, we started to, re that's another thing that sort of changed over time is, like, yes, he did have these administrative skills, but we realized that, especially looking at modern governments and being just people being more savvy about how governments and, and people in power operate, the methods in which he used to do this and the people that suffered as a result of these things, yes, he kept order, but order doesn't mean justice. And yeah, at the expense of what? Things. Yeah. Yeah. At the expense of a lot of suffering. Like, yes, Tywin's, the Lord's, did well. Tywin's like a big proponent of trickle down economics, basically. <laughs> the equivalent of that in Westeros, which is you take what we trickle down, not it will trickle down. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, it's not reliable. <laughs> if you're on the on the on the receiving end of the trickle, you're like, that's not enough. You know, this isn't fair. This isn't just. This isn't good. Uh, Even worse in a in a game of thrones type world where there's not like a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurialism or whatever like if you don't have the royal bloodline it just doesn't matter you yeah know? <laughs> that's true that's true uh 
Kirsty Angel sends a super chat and says, could the others be Night King and company flayed? Could that be the difference in why they don't seem like humans? Could that be like the, the, the bridge between what they look like now and, and humans? That's an interesting idea because I've always wanted to try to include the Boltons skin <laughs> flaying into an explanation for their anti-Starkness, which to me, that was always the skin changing thing. Like if the Starks are skin changers flaying them would be like to reveal what they really are you know it, it sort of symbolically fits like they're the anti-skin changer and they're the anti-starks so they would do the thing they would be anti the thing that enables the starks power which in part could be dire wolves warging whatever i like the idea it's pretty cool i mean i don't know that this is this fits with the way they look i mean they look all like pale and and ghostly. I mean, they're transformed no matter what. Yeah, they're transformed no matter what. You're right. It, so. it, 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 strictly speaking, the transformation process could involve flaying all of the skin off of someone's body. Wow. And then that skin regrows as what they have now. Um, Damn, that's that certainly dark. possible. I can't, I can't say dark. it's not. I like um, it. Skin replaced with ice. I don't yeah. like it, but I do like it. I mean, I don't yeah, like it because like, I don't like thinking about it. It's like Sans, <laughs> it's like Sansa's uh, iconic quote, you know, my skin has turned from porcelain to ivory, Ooh. you know, that, that her, my skin has turned from flesh to ice. It's <laughs> turned from flayed, from skin to nothing to ice. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. I like it. It's cool. It's a little out there, but it's not too out there. I do like that. It's creative. I don't think I've ever heard that before either. Definitely points for originality. I yeah. like it. That's cool. Good job, Kirsty Angel. Maybe we should call you Kirsty Devil. Yeah. Good ideas <laughs> like that. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Let's take a, uh, a little break here. Uh, a couple questions, or rather re references to last week and uh, a couple of other times. Debbie Dane says, Lady Agnes Blackwood also, quote, famously said, I have other sons, as King Harwin strangled two of her sons in front of her. Harwin being, uh, Harwin, I believe, Hardhand, the grandfather of Heron the Black, if I'm remembering my Ironborn history correctly. So this is in reference to, Sean, what you were bring you and Nina brought up the historical parallels to Robert's Rebellion and the I have other sons line that, who was it that said that? The, uh, the Stanley, Lord Stanley said that, isn't that right? The one you were comparing to Frey? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So this is uh, so George. Yeah, sorry, it's muted, but yeah, George specifically seems to have taken that line and given it to Lady Agnes. So definitely, uh, good catch there. Paul Barry says it was so basically makes a few points here, and I can summarize them as saying, if Rhaegar just had a little more, he could have beaten Robert. Either having Sir Arthur at his side, which arguably is more than a little more, having the, the finest knight in the realm with the best sword in the realm at your side. That might be more than a little more. But just give him Dark Sister, maybe that's enough. Like a slightly better sword. Maybe more than slightly better, but a better sword. I mean, he did wound Robert. If that had been a Valyrian steel blade, he would have... That cut would have been worse. It might have been enough to, to win the fight. So... Yeah, it just goes to show it was a close run thing, as they say. Mm hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, a comment from a while back that I wanted to refer to from frequent commenter and supporter Kat Ovivas says From a medical perspective, what Miri Mazdur did to Drogo with sewing that flap of skin back on is almost certainly intended to harm him because that you don't do that in medicine, you don't sew dead skin back onto a wound that's asking for an infection george probably does probably knows that probably didn't just goof up the medicine on his side which is possible like you could say maybe george just screwed that up but cato vivas specifically says she hasn't noticed george make that mistake anywhere else so it doesn't it's not a very strong counterpoint because george seems to have that under basic understanding of medicine and which apparently i don't <laughs> or i might have caught that sooner and she says Nina pointed this out, too. So it was kind of backing Nina's argument here that that Mary Mazdur was trying to poison Drogo from the get go. And he when he tore the thing off, he was actually saving himself. <laughs> he just thought it was bothering him, but actually it was poisoning him. So, yeah. OK. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we know that she wanted to revenge herself on him, but she was just saying, oh, but I only heal. I'm my religion says I heal. And I think a lot of us fell for that, including Drogo. <laughs> <laughs> and Danny. <laughs> so it worked. Mary Mazdor fooled even a lot of us readers because we're not doctors. But those of you who know medicine were like, nah, <laughs> I don't think so. That's just, you can't call that uh, real medicine there. 
So good call, good call, very good call. That, that's that that probably settles it for me, unless something else comes out that uh, changes it. A long expected soundscape sends a super chat and says, "Hope we can have these types of theory videos now and then as time goes on, especially when wind comes." Thanks all. Yes, absolutely. This is of course Jordan Reynolds, who we referred to earlier with the a long expected soundscape is the name of the Lord of the Rings soundscape, which is a very Lord of the Rings e title. I'm sure we're gonna be have. We're going to have uh, lots of theory videos when Winds of Winter comes out, but more of these just as we go as well. Um, we'll, we'll, have, we'll probably space them out a little more than this one because this was, of course, a little bit impromptu. But uh, yeah, it's a good thing to do every once in a while. We have fun with them. You guys have fun with them. So yeah. Yeah, I think really we're gonna do this tier list for part three. Yeah, we'll we'll have it we'll maybe have it. we'll we'll up our game next time and try to try to format it a little differently. Also, uh, this episode is sponsored by Smile Brilliant. You've seen the results on my whitening project. You've seen my teeth get whiter. You've seen the results. You know it works. You know it works even months later. And you also know that your teeth require regular upkeep anyway. There's both the beautification, the looking nice, and the actual health that goes behind oral and dental care. They're both important. They both help your confidence. They both help your health, especially the taking care of your teeth part. And Smile Brilliant's a great way to do that. You have to spend money on your teeth. May as well save money at it. May as well buy the best available products. May as well get stuff from experts. That's what Smile Brilliant is. You can get 20% off if you go to smilebrilliant.com using the code Westeros, whether it's the teeth whitening products, whether it's day-to-day -day oral care, whether it's gum health, whether it's anything else you can think of, flossing, brushing, electric toothbrushes, uh, plaque buildup markers, or even something more advanced like teeth grinding, they have the solutions that you need, or maybe a few that you didn't know you need. Your audience, Stannis Baratheon? <laughs> Stannis definitely needs Smile Brilliant. <laughs> he is a serious teeth. He doesn't just grind in his sleep, though. He grinds when he's awake. He must be really bad in his sleep. They might have to market it different to him. It might have to be frown brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> frown darkly. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, so smile brilliant. 20% off using the code Westeros. Highly recommend it. Take care of your teeth. You will definitely, your past self will definitely thank you if you do so. All right, let's get back to it. We have got plenty of theories to discuss. Minger a Pessa sends a whole list of them. Uh, Rob sent the cat's paw. Huh? Rob murdering his own brother. I think you would uh, need to uh, support that. <laughs> with some... He does end this with call me crazy. I know. Okay. I'll call you crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a plus A equals Danny. So that's Ares plus Ashara equals Danny. The timeline does not really support that. It is not completely out of whack because Ashara was at court uh, as a wait lady in waiting to Elia, but we know where Danny was born at Dragonstone and Rayella being there and a whole bunch of other witnesses. So yeah, I can't really can't really go with that one. Uh, the next one, Danny isn't human but a hybrid shadow, very much like Stannis's shadow babies, but more advanced. Same with her dragons. Okay, well she is special. She might be some sort of Unique, chosen one, Azor Ahai reborn. And if you believe in reincarnation, and if this is reincarnation, then there has to be some logistical explanation behind it. It could be a shadow. It could be a soul being reborn. I mean, if you say Azor Ahai reborn, then this isn't totally crazy. But linking it to Stannis' the shadow babies, I don't know about that, or, or, or the dragons. But if the dragons are reborn in the same way, like there is magic behind this, I'm not totally against it. I mean, the idea of a spirit world and, and souls and all that fits pretty well in a fantasy s scenario. And the idea of calling a soul back to life, bringing it into a new host makes sense. That might be what happened with the dragons. I mean, after all, the, there's some deaths that are associated with right before the dragons and uh, Miri Mazdur's death, maybe the Blood Riders, Drogo himself. Some people say that death may, must pay for life. If that's to be taken literally, then you could involve spirit transfers. We already see consciousness go from human to animal and then back again. So it's definitely not crazy. This one is maybe the least crazy here. Of these, There's a few others that are maybe a little crazy. 
But I, I, I mean, it still seems like you're sort of like stretching the definitions of these words maybe, and yeah. looking at it in symbolic ways. And maybe you can, maybe you can call it that and it fits in a way, but it doesn't seem like that's what George is doing. Mm. You know, uh, he says there'll be a Night's King reborn. And it'll be Rhaegar that I don't think so. Cause Rhaegar's body was born. Now, if we're using the same sort of souls exist and can be called back, then it could be anybody, but I don't know why you would choose Rhaegar because Rhaegar wouldn't be like this vindictive soul that, wants to bring this pain on the realm like he was trying to save the realm he was one of the people like on board with stopping all this so i kind of i don't think he would be a very good candidate for the one to uh do that and let you know i i guess the idea would be that it's it's vindictive he's mad that he was killed and uh, robert took the throne and all that and he's a revenant and bent on revenge but isn't that doesn't eh. I, even if that was the case there's still 10 other people it could be why not Ares? yeah or, you know why not yeah I, I prefer the revenge of the children of the forest it's their revenge their and you know they did this long ago to fight humanity um next is tywin and brood or targaryen descendants down queen reign of targaryen including joanna uh well i mean there is connections to targaryen and lannister but i don't see how Tywin gets connected to them. There's certainly possibilities that Ares and Joanna were connected. That has a little more going for it. But I'm not sure where. So Reina, because Reina did live in the West. Okay, so this is why I guess is this is where it's coming from. Queen, she was called the Queen in the West for a while. So she could have certainly been involved with something. But she and she did stay at Castle Rock for quite a while. And the Lord of Castle Rock was like, Yo, so you've been staying here a while. You know, we, we're happy to have you as a guest, but if you want to repay our kindness, Dragon Eggs would be a wonderful way to do that. She's like, I think I should leave. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's hard to obscure the parentage of when a woman is the, the parent. When the woman is the delivers a child, it's hard to conceal that. When a man, it's easier to hide a man being a father because he does his thing and he's gone. You know, he doesn't have a baby bump and... There's not nine months of hiding. So this that's why it's kind of hard for me to, to buy a theory like this because it's it's concealing a woman's pregnancy, which, given it's casterly rock, it's more able to conceal things. But again, you got servants. Like, this place is run by servants. Like, how are they going to not talk about it? And it would get out. I, I, anytime there's a lot of servants around, it makes it hard to conceal things, especially a pregnancy. And, yeah. Especially of the... The queen, especially of, you know, the royals and uh, yeah. yeah. She technically wasn't a queen. She was just queen by by title, by honorific. Because her husband yeah. was Aegon, the uncrowned that Magor usurped. They never sat the Iron Throne, but still. She was the proximity argument works. Um, but yeah, it's difficult to uh to to square a, a hidden pregnancy like that. The last one is Damon Targaryen's father was a strong, most likely Lucamore. Okay, so Lucamor was Lucamor the Lusty. He's the one that was gelded and sent to the wall for having three wives while he was amongst the King's Guard and 16 children. The wives were ignorant of each other, but not of the fact that he was a King's Guard, so they were punished as well. The children were blameless, of course. Now, Daemon Targaryen's father was supposed to be Balon Targaryen. And I guess Lucamor has the proximity thing going for him. He was a King's Guard, so he could have been around in you know, that era but balon and Alyssa were just in love they like Alyssa just loved him she was mad for him so i don't know about the cheating here uh, it doesn't really fit with what she knows like she was really devoted to him like she was in love with him from like she was infatuated with him since she was a child and she didn't live a very long life so i don't know i mean lucamore was handsome and charming but I, don't know, I, I, I struggle to, to fit this one. This and a couple of these others, you know, we're finding technical ways that they might potentially could have happened, but we're not covering like what purpose does it serve the story? Why would George have done these things? How do we reveal it to the audience? There's a lot of uh, holes in this. So if Damon was like really anti bastard, and it turns out that he was one, that you know that would be something, right? There's but, like some irony that comes from that or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. Uh, from Maggie Care Berg. Otto's baby mama slash Allison's mom was Sarah Targaryen or a daughter of Sarah. Okay, so 
Sarah left Old Town in 85 AC, three years before Allison was born. This would have to be book Allison. Show Allison, of course, is a different age. Show Allison might fit slightly better here because the age might work a little better. Uh, but actually, she might work worse because Sarah would have been gone from Old Town even longer and it's harder to place her back, which is why... Maggie suggests maybe a daughter of Sarah. And Sarah did have children. And, and some of those children, the males at least, came back to make their claim at the Great Council. So if Otto had a child by Sarah after she became a sex worker, why would that be considered her daughter? I mean, why would that be a true-born daughter? Why would, they, why would, they, why would she be a high tower? You know? Uh, so it would have to be a sneaky one where they, like, passed her off as... Now, which, to be fair, we don't know who Otto's wife was and Allison's mother was, but there's nothing to suggest a, this person was a mysterious figure, just that she died a while ago and they didn't ha haven't had much cause to mention her in the course of the show or books. So, yeah, it would be interesting. It would be kind of um, a neat book ending, like both sides of of the Greens and the Blacks are more Targaryen than we think. And undermining his own it seems family. like if that was the case it would be brought up yeah. by Otto and allison as a, as a so, point of proximity yeah you're right yeah you're totally it would right. add to their claim and other people would latch on to that as a reason for supporting them and like it, it makes me think that it's not true because there would be it would have come into play yeah i agree that's a, that's a great point like just how corley's was like we have the valerian blood like what is this all you know that's we're closer yeah. so yeah they would have said oh we've got this too sarah Tar yeah so, yeah, that's, that's a very good point, Sean. Mark Ridge from the Facebook group says, Jamie will have his hand restored by Thoros. Jamie has been gradually restoring peace and justice to the Riverlands, which was the original mandate of the group that became the Brother Without Banners. Thoros doesn't seem thrilled by Stoneheart's methods, and depending on what happens between her, Jamie, and Brienne, I suspect that Thoros will thank Jamie for filling the Brotherhood's task by restoring his hand, which may or may not resemble Victorian's Volcano Claw. Volcano Claw. What a cool name for it. I've never heard that before. It is kind of a... It is kind of a talon <laughs> claw. And then the Valonqar shall wrap his hands uh, around Cersei's pale white throat and choke the life from her. So that is part of the uh, the backing of this theory is that the Valonqar, if you think the Valonqar is Jamie, which I do, and a lot of us do, how can he wrap his hands uh, around Cersei's pale white throat if he only has one hand? Well, he does have a golden hand. It's still his hand. He wouldn't necessarily be wrapping it more like just sort of placing it there. <laughs> And like he puts it when he's grabbing a wine cup. I don't know if he could even do that if it's a closed fist because it's able to hold a wine cup. I don't think he could get that around her throat. Anyway, visions aren't supposed to be like super literal anyway. So I'm not sure we can take too much from the hand, the, the, the plural of hands there. But it's not nothing. And given the Victorian thing, I mean, his hand wasn't gone. It didn't regrow from nothing. So that may be a little bit of a stretch, but it's not. Again, it's not crazy, but I do like the general idea here. I think maybe this points to something else. I, I, I want to take this theory in another direction and say that maybe, yeah, maybe Thoros will end up respecting what Jamie has done for the Riverlands in the long run. If he brings peace to the Riverlands, it does a decent job of it. If he escapes Thor, if he escapes the Brotherhood and still does good, I can see why Thoros might look on that positively and be like, especially given his current leader is not so positive and going and getting darker and darker all the time. So he might think, yeah, that's a good thing. Or so maybe something else brings him out of it. Something finds out what's going on in the North. Maybe Jamie wants to go North as well. And Thoros goes with him or something like that. There's a lot of opportunity for Thoros to be one of the people that sees Jamie as redeemed. You know, maybe not all the, maybe not every reader does certainly not every in world character will, but maybe Thoros will be one of the few who's like, you know what, this Jamie guy, he really when when the chips were down, he did good. Not all the people recognize that. So that maybe that is more in line with him getting his hand back. Um, and I think a lot of the times that's where some of these theories I lean is symbolic interpretations of what's coming rather than a change that's coming for a character rather than a, a thing that's going to happen with their body or their person. I don't think I explained that very well, but <laughs> I'll think about it and maybe try some other time. Now, but Nina pushes back a little on this idea by pointing out that it's easy to see that Jamie is not restoring peace and justice through maybe just peace, maybe more of the Tywin Lannister version of order. 
where things are locked down, not so much as justice, not so much as fairness. And yeah, I mean, he's on the side of the ones that tore the Riverlands up in the first place. It's his family, that, his father, that caused all this pain and suffering in the first place by unleashing Lannister men to do this. So maybe it's just too much for Jamie to, to for Jamie to get credit for that because he is yeah he's bringing peace in a way but it's the the victors in this peace are the the people are the villains one step at a time like this is new territory for Jamie to be in right he wasn't trained to be a negotiator in the first place and it's hard to worry about justice when there's you know, physical violence going all over the place. You got to first settle things down a little bit, then make some rules. Like, you know, maybe I'm being too much of a Jamie defender, but uh, I th we'll see how things go. You know, just because he doesn't perfectly institute justice on his first try doesn't mean <laughs> he can't get there over yeah, time, you know, uh, much less have the right intentions or be perceived that way by Thoros or Good point. Yeah. on and on. And Nina also points out that there's other ways to interpret hands. Remember that, for example, Tyrion choked Shay to death with a chain of hands necklace. So he used one hand twisted. So he only needed one of his own hands, but it was a necklace, a hand necklace there that actually choked her. So, yeah. And it doesn't even have to be a literal choking. It can just be that Jamie's actions took down Cersei. You know, they could, it could be literal, but yeah, it doesn't have to be. It could be that two different one time hands of the king work together to yeah. put Cersei to death or whatever. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Lana Joy says Danny has a miscarriage at the end of a dance of dragons due to her conditions and those poisonous berries she eats. She is indeed fertile and able to have children. When a character keeps thinking of how they can't have children, it seems the author is trying to keep something in mind. Um, Nina, for one, 100% believes Danny had a miscarriage as well. She says, I've never believed, however, that what Miri said was prophetic or otherwise carried any supernatural weight. I think Miri was simply listing things that seemed impossible in order to emphasize to Danny that Drogo would never come back to her. Because remember, once Drogo died, Miri had every reason to believe Danny would be spending the rest of her life in the Dosh Kaleen. Yeah, so that's, that's something that's easy to forget that Danny may stubbornly reject what the Dothraki will force her to do, but Miri Mazdor has every reason to think that that's going to be her fate because otherwise she foresees the dragons being born and Danny somehow becoming the first ever Khaleesi and somehow getting these, you know, it doesn't really make sense from where Miri's sitting that Danny's going to end up anywhere other than the Dash Colleen. So yeah, you're not going to have any kids. You're basically, you're not going to even be with a man again. You're going to be live with the widows. So yeah, so metaphorically speaking, she'll never have a chance to have more children. So yeah, and what are we supposed to think? That Mary performed some thorough examination of Danny's womb? Mm, I mean, it could be true that given everything Danny's Mary has seen, she does have experience. She's delivered a lot of children. She could say, okay, after what happened in there with this ba this weird magic and death and all that, yeah, your womb's not going to function anymore. It is believable. But the evidence here suggests Danny had a miscarriage. That, that overwrites the past evidence. Like, this is newer evidence. So I got to agree that it seems like she had a miscarriage, which means she probably has a functioning womb. Miriam Mazdor also could just have been inaccurate. She could have had some vision that she misinterpreted. She could be dishonest. Yeah. On and on. She's trying so. to harm the people that did all this damage to her in her life and just killed everything she loved. Why? What's a few lies against that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing. I wouldn't hold that against Miri. And so that's pretty, pretty big deal and pretty important. On the other hand, I mean, there's other, you know, there's things like it reminds us that most times when people have sex it doesn't result in a baby like danny had sex with dario a bunch of times and you know it but i mean most married couples have a few children or one child and next to hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of times of having sex so, yeah. <laughs> hopefully it's that hopefully it's thousands y'all <laughs> <laughs> i was like wow you're so optimistic <laughs> hopefully we all have sexual uh, sexual healthy relationships there yes <laughs> not like dario yeah. and danny <laughs> or even Dro or drogo and danny <laughs> more uh something more 
<laughs> on the up and up. Shout out sex thousands of times. Thousands of times. <laughs> Sounds ludicrous. <laughs> so, uh, Cam from Discord. My submission is this. Tywin built the sex tunnels. We know it was built by a hand of some sort, and the fact that Tywin later in life had certain desires of ladies of the evening, the fact that he was with Shay, etc. It says a lot of his hypocrisy. It was why he resented his father so much. So why not, from a narrative stance, say that he went so far as to build a tunnel for himself to keep his secret and hide his shame? There are some hints, too, because in the tunnels, there are those red and gold themes in the light, in the windows, etc. Yes. Shea says a hearty yes to this one. Nina, as well, 100% believe. Nina has specifically cited those golden red themes in the light, as well. Mm -hmm. So I knew she would agree with this one. But yeah, also, two of the sex workers there, Murray and Dancy, look very much like Rohan Weber, uh, Tywin's grandmother, and mm. they look like Tywin. And so, yeah, he has he has some bastards. And Nina also gives a kudos to Joanna Lannister on Tumblr, which is why I am so uh, passionate about this theory as well, because I'm also friends with her, and she made a very convincing case to me many years ago. Um yeah. It is really strong. The, the only the 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 thing about this theory that I would the only thing I would push back against this theory is that it's sort of so strong because it fits so well, and there aren't alternatives. It could easily be a hand from way back, and Tywin just used these tunnels that were already there. He he could have used them and still this saying these tunnels aren't Tywin doesn't say he wasn't visiting the brothels in secret. Yeah. These aren't these these ideas are mutually exclusive. So Tywin may have just use tunnels that were already there yes for this to be fine. clear and the windows could just be a way to show yeah tywin tywin was here but not necessarily that he built them but yeah i mean why not have him build them you know? yeah to be clear the thing that is i'm most passionate about here is that tywin has two bastard daughters that are working yeah. as sex workers that part is stronger oh. than him being the one who actually built the tunnels yeah, yeah i agree with that uh it does fit for so many reasons, but it's also just one of those things like let's it's it's one of those theories where earlier I said, like with the Valyria stuff and the faceless men, it's like it's also one of the best ideas because we don't have other ideas. This is I wouldn't go so far as to say we don't have other ideas for this, and that's why it's the best. No, this is the best because it fits super well. Everything about it fits really well. But the fact that we don't have other theories is not evidence for it being Tywin. Because it's just that. This one idea just fits so well that people stopped looking. <laughs> I feel like it's like because it and and there's an endless supply of hands to choose from. There's not like any great way to to narrow it down. Like it could be, uh, I'm forgetting who was hand before Tywin. <laughs> the, I don't all, think John Connington was doing that. <laughs> yeah, John Connington was. You're right, John Connington. Well, he was after. Yeah, he was in the war and before Tywin was. I forget who was before Tywin. Osmond Strong. Uh, well, he was one of the ones. Anyway. I mean, yeah, uh, and then Baratheon, Osmond, yeah. The anyway, there was the Stefan, yeah. Robert's grandfather was was hand of the king. So anyway, that's a good one. Like that a lot. Micah, shout out to Micah, the minor character guy. Bowen Marsh is called the old pomegranate because Ghost John is going to eat him shortly after the assassination, thus symbolically tying John to the underworld. This ties into a similar underworld themes to go with Arya, Sansa, Brienne, Bran. I first saw the theory from at curtsy while you tweet on Twitter. Alongside that, I theorized the assassinators won't be here long since Leathers and One One are right there. Leathers was an earshot of John. Leathers and One One are a lot more dangerous than Bowen Marsh and his cadre of of stabbers who were not really warriors, but stewards and and builders and such. So if anyone goes for them, yeah, they're screwed if anyone attacks them. <laughs> Whether it's Ghost One One leathers or all of the above yeah th it's pretty cool it's a cool idea like pomegranates absolutely are a symbol of the underworld that's a thing since it's a greek myth thing right it, it, we brought this up before it's definitely comes up with sansa like little finger eating pomegranates in front of her and talking about how messy they are and pomegranates coming up in other places so this is one of the ones where it, there's a lot to tie john to the underworld anyway so it doesn't have to be this but it it definitely does fit um he is the old pomegranate his face is red so yeah, there is that but it's kind of neat he's kind of shepherding he is kind of shepherding john into the underworld as the leader of the plot to stab him i kind of like it yeah um it's one of those things that uh it's it's pretty deep it's a little it's pretty meta but it does 
it does kind of work. You know, the, the pomegranate at the end, like he could have chosen any, it could have been the old apple because <laughs> other red things he could have chosen. So it's not like pomegranate was his only choice here. So George, pomegranate is such a symbolic fruit. It's, it's hard, kind of hard to imagine George just threw it in there without having some sort of intent. So I do kind of, I do kind of lean towards good chance of it, mm. but it could just be unintentional symbolism you know george wanted to give this guy a red face nickname that gave him a little more detail made it a little more made him pop a little more off the pages gave him a little more description but it does absolutely fit <laughs> what's being said here does anyone have any good resources on reading more about pomegranates in the underworld i think there's probably tons of them out there because it's it's a greek myth thing and there's lots of great resources on greek mythology out there in this world i listen to several podcasts that, that tackle greek myths um, one of my recent favorites is, uh, uh, ancient history fangirl and there's lots of others though. that just don't come to mind cause I haven't listened to them as recently. So, Hmm. Yes. Yeah. You've been in baseball mode. <laughs> I have been in baseball mode lately. Yes. It always happens in March and April and February and January and December and November and October and September. <laughs> no, <'cause laughs> I'll stop. No, wait I could have kept going. What? I only had a few as months left. What about August? <laughs> <laughs> uh next up is uh also from our discord the jedi of chicago Ooh, the jedi of chicago very cool hmm. hmm not sure if this is really a theory or guess but what are the odds that john's true name is not aemon aegon jaharis daemon or daron but is actually jacaris i mean both are considered bastards by many in the realm they would be sons of the heir to the throne. Neither have traditional Targaryen features. And I would think that Lyanna would know the story of Jacarys coming to Winterfell and being the last dragon rider to visit Winterfell and thinking that would be a good name for a Stark slash Targaryen kid. Yeah, I mean, it does fit in that sense. On the other hand, Rhaegar didn't see this child as a bastard. He saw him as trueborn, I think. I think he saw him as, like, he, I believe he and Lyanna saw themselves as married. Whether it would legally count or not is different. So I don't, but I don't think he would choose the name based on that r logic then. So if he's not thinking of his child as a bastard, he's not going to choose a bastard name. Also, I think he probably wanted to choose the name that fulfilled the destiny, which would be Aegon. There's, I'm, I support the possibility there was Aemon. I think Jaehaerys is a fine third choice, but I think it's a distant third, personally. Visenya. As Shea still likes Visenya or Visenyo. No, no, I, <laughs> no I, it's not Visenyo. I truly think <laughs> Rhaegar just assumed he was going to have a girl. Mm. He, there was no, he just was confident it was a girl. So he, there, was no, there was no male name even considered. That's that my sense, theory, though. and I feel strongly about it. It's a good one. Hard to argue against. Yeah, I mean, I think we may find we, that one may not be when we find out one day, because if he thought it was going to be a girl, he would never have known that it wasn't. Yeah. Because she, she, he was clearly born after Rhaegar was dead. And would have had no way to communicate with Liana in the, in between. Yeah. So yeah, so, yeah, I'll die on that hill. I'll die on that, hill, on that trident. Fact. You'll die on that trident. <laughs> on that tower like, no, on that Vesenia's hill. <laughs> oh, Vesenia's yeah, hill. You yes. couldn't hear me. I was like, I you didn't, didn't laugh right. at my joke. <laughs> uh, I like at least part of Nina's thought on this is that John is John's true name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I, 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 similar to like even if you're like adopted. I don't know if your original biological parents are your true parents, the people that raised you, your parents, like maybe someone intended for you to have some of the name at birth, but the name that you grew up with your whole life that you think of yourself as that everybody calls you. Yeah. That's your true name. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You notice I didn't say true name, but intended yeah. name, the name that Rhaegar thought. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, it's never, it was, he was never called this. Maybe he was actually, maybe Liana called them something and Ned was like, we can't no. call him Aegon. No, no way. That would yeah. give it away. <laughs> so I do. I could see why the same as young Griff, why they would conceal his name. But his name is John. I agree with the point that his name is John. That's what he's been called all his life. He's not going to change his name like John. Like John Snow is going to continue to want to be called John Snow, I think. Or maybe maybe he'd want to be called John Stark or something. But John, I, I've, I'm confident in that, too. Whatever. I agree with the possibility that Rhaegar intended a Visenya or that Lyanna intended an Aegon. But he's John. Yeah, I agree with that. That that ultimate bottom line. But it's still interesting to think about what they wanted to call him or what they might what they thought he would be. So these two things both work. They both work. Uh, also from our Discord, Sky says, "I like the one about Rickon warging cannibal maximum chaos." <laughs> 
That is Maximum Chaos. Rickon Warging Cannibal. So Rickon, which Rickon are we even talking about? Rickon, the, the, the son of Kregan or Rickon, the father of Kregan? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure which, but Cannibal could be around for both of them. So uh, more likely the latter, I think. I mean, the, the, the older one, the one that came along later, the, the son of Kregan rather than the father of Kregan. The younger so, one. <laughs> the younger one, yes. Not the older one, really. Yeah, not the older one. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. So Cannibal, of course, is a wild dragon. Sean, you haven't met the Cannibal yet. The Cannibal is a wild dragon around the time of the dance. You'll meet probably meet the Cannibal next season in, in House of the Dragon Season 2. Uh, cannibal is called the Cannibal because Cannibal eats other young dragons, <laughs> has been known to attack the hatchery and just fly in there and munch on baby dragons. And has possibly killed some young adults as well. There's all sorts of weird, like, folklore about the cannibal in world. About how oh, cannibals been here since before the Targaryens, which is is soundly trounced as a theory by the maesters. Like there would have been some evidence of this dragon being here before. There's it's and plus that's a really long time. And yes, dragons live a long time, but that long? I don't know about that. Uh, so which it wouldn't actually be that long. It would be less than 300 years potentially so that's not insanely long but it is pretty damn long like valerian lived to be well i forget valerian's age we don't know valerian's age we didn't know when he was born but vagar was 181 died at 181 not the year 181 but died at the age of 181 so that's really long <laughs> and uh so maybe it's not too much of a stretch to say 300 is possible but Anyway, so that, it's a tough stretch without there being a bunch of evidence. Yeah. So to warg into an animal, I think you need to have had a prior bond with that animal. It is certainly there's nothing to suggest that warging into a dragon is impossible. On the other hand, we have no certain evidence that it's ever happened. It kind of feels like it would have if it were possible, you know, given how long of a time frame we're dealing with how dragons and skin changers have both existed in this world for thousands of years. The fact that is, is it really never come up. Maybe they're too powerful for a skin changer to control. Maybe there's just something about them that, it, that prevents that from happening. They are magical creatures after all. So, but if, but if Bran can get into a person's head and control them, I kind of think that he could, a powerful enough greens here could do that to a dragon too, or, or skin changer. I doubt a dragon's mind is more impenetrable than a person's. You know what I mean? Although, to be fair, this is Hodor, who is arguably a quote-unquote weaker mind than a full than a full adult, maybe. But even Varamir was partly able to get in Thistle's mind, the one woman that she was pushing him out. Like, if he had been stronger, he probably could have done it. So Bran probably can do it to a, a fully formed human, right? An adult. Especially with more practice and experience yeah, and, and a more was, magical place or a person with a better bond or all these yeah. factors. Yeah. Varamir was doing it out of desperation and he was already weak and not he's definitely not as strong as, as Bran. So, yeah, so you it feels like if he was almost able to do it, that someone else could. So I feel like the idea, we can't discount this theory on grounds of it's impossible to warg, to skin change a dragon. So I think that is is totally valid. And the idea that a cannibal would, that the, the dragon did have a human mind inside it that was a person who was wild and crazy and violent then it would certainly fit <laughs> the person but some animal i mean but some animals are just like that so as the simpsons proved with the elephant episode some animals are just jerks <laughs> <laughs> just like people <laughs> uh from pickle 14 Mine is the phrase that there must always be a Stark in Winterfell has deeper direct meaning and that the huge negative consequences occur in the North when this fails to happen, i.e. the others reemerging or something like hard home, etc. Absolutely love the idea. There's not a lot to go on to really say, yes, definitely this is true. It's one of those ones that I'm, I'm drawn to it because I like it. Uh, I, and I think it fits, but I do think it's still a little short on evidence, but... It was given a big boost, frankly, by House of the Dragon because George told the showrunners about this dream that he says is book applicable as well. So if there must, if Aegon had this dream that Targaryens had to sit the throne and have all do all this other stuff to stop the stuff happening in the North, why couldn't the Starks have had some sort of vision that they were part of this or that there had to be a Stark? There has to be a Targaryen on the throne to stop the why. 
th- there must be a Stark and Winterfell. Like it, it's the same thing, but for a different family and a family that has more proximity to the region where this this icy doom will emanate from. On the other hand, it fits super well to just peace and justice is fulfilled when a Stark rules. That's been the way for a long time. Why change what? It, why fix what isn't broken? Like the 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 guy uh, the the clansman who helped Bran and Rick or Bran and, and Asha and all them Osha escape and told them you know, when a Stark was in Winterfell, a woman could walk from the the wall to Winterfell, you know, in her name day gown, meaning naked, and not get harassed or molested by anyone. You know, and that has nothing to do with magic or that's just Starks are good at keeping justice and peace. Right. So that's a statement of Starks being in charge is good for everyone. It has nothing to do with magic or anything. So it's one of those things that it could be both. There's more evidence for the mundane logistical side, but I love the magical side as well. What do you what do you all think? Any any takes on this? Sean, you're muted. Silence I'm not sure if this is, is an, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if this is necessarily an argument for or against, and I might even be inaccurate about this, but when Ned was down at the Tower of Joy or at the Battle of the Trident, who was the Stark and Winterfell then? Benjen. Benjen, yeah. Benjen didn't take the black. He wasn't already on the no, wall? No, he waited to take the black, and then he went and... Uh, yeah. There's That's some theories it. about maybe he had a role in, like, telling someone something. Maybe he felt guilty about what happened to Lyanna. Maybe he had a role in that, or with Ashara, maybe less likely, but... Yeah. But the fact that, but also just more, more mundanely, the fact that he had Ned now had a son, there was yeah. Robin born. So there was another Stark that, that he was now, Benjen could see himself as extra at that point. And thus, good time to join the watch. There could be more to it. Rob was born before Ned went south. Rob was born uh, uh, during, after, yeah. during the war. Yeah. While Rob, Rob and Kat, uh, Ned and Kat got married to seal up the alliance. Rob was conceived and then Ned went okay. off to go. Then Ned left. Yeah. And so, okay. Yeah. Are there, can you, can we think of any other moments where there wouldn't have been a Stark at Winterfell? Maybe when Rickard and Brandon were executed by, uh, I guess Ned would have, no, Ned was in the Vale then. There Were may you, not have been a Stark in Winterfell then. Where yeah. was Benjen? He wasn't there then. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, still would have been Benjen. Yeah, still, still would have been Benjen. He would have been really young, but yeah, yeah still would have been Benjen. Yeah. yeah, you're totally right. He would have been super young, but yes, yeah. he still would have been there. He wouldn't have been anywhere else. Yeah. So yeah, I guess still was a, even then. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's literally a Stark being present in Winterfell or just the Starks not being in charge, you know? Like, how do we take this? Yeah. Um, Does it have to be in the castle? Can yeah. it be in the hunting grounds outside? Or yeah. And we don't know when the others returned. I mean, the others returned... They had returned before the prologue. Like that was, I don't think that was their first appearance since. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. That's what I was wondering if, if there wasn't a Stark and Winterfell at that time when Ned had left, I was like, maybe that's when the others Mm. arose. Yeah, it could be. So there are some. But if Benjamin was there. hmm. So there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah, it's an open idea. I think I, I take it sort of a combo metaphorically and literally like. If bad things will happen if Stark is not in charge when other bad things happen. You want a Stark to be you want a Stark to be in charge when the S hits the fan or <laughs> when the ice hits the, the wall. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh Creep says the theory that Euron is a failed apprentice of Blood Raven is always has me intrigued. Haven't ever really delved into it too much, but I've seen it mentioned once or twice, and I would love to hear something more in depth about it. Okay, well to to really get in depth with it, I recommend our Euron Greyjoy episode with poor Quentin who is a big proponent of this theory as well. And yeah, this, this theory has been around for a while. It's been around since a feast for crows since ever since Euron said things that sounded like what blood Raven said about, you'll never know if you take the leap or, you know, you can, you'll never know if you can fly and all this other stuff. That's like very similar language to that. Plus of his, the way he pushes back against the gods has vibes of being rejected from something. Yeah. It, it, a little vindictive maybe or opportunistic maybe maybe a little both so the way it would uh, the gist of it is i again recommend listening to that episode in, in in full i know the theory has evolved even a little bit since then but not too much not too much so the idea would be that blood raven was looking for the birth of the next greens here or the prof- prophesied 
being that would defeat the others or maybe even not prophet maybe prophecy is the wrong word if he can see the future regularly it's probably not prophecy it's just i can see what's going to happen <laughs> i don't know i don't know maybe you just don't call it prophecy when it's so consistent and and you can do it at will uh whatever you call it he was looking for brand he was looking for where this this being would be reborn like like kind of like how the dalai lama is chosen you know they go they go around and look for the kids and eventually they find which by the way that happened like today or last oh, night really? the They're newest dalai lama, lama was picked yeah last night like oh, yesterday was it bobby hill it was not bobby hill <laughs> it was a, it was a well i don't know the child's name it was a mongolian boy named bobby hill maybe maybe bob he <laughs> Il. yeah it's like the <laughs> mongolian version of, version of bobby. <laughs> Uh, if you all don't know, there's an episode of King of the Hill where the llamas come and because Super News and Phones or Laotian and anyways, they come and they think Bobby's a llama. It's a real good episode. It's one of my favorites, perhaps. Yeah, actually. that show's so good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and it's coming back. It if y'all didn't know, King of the Hill is coming back. It is. They're going to be aged up. We're going to have an adult Bobby Hill. Mm -hmm. Can I wait? <laughs> Uh, so the idea was that he, before he found Bran, he found a uh, Euron who was older than Bran, obviously. So he might have found him and tested him to see if he was the one, like they test the Dalai Lama. <laughs> this is the real dark <laughs> version of the Dalai Lama here, and he didn't pass for whatever reason. Whatever, like picture the three-eyed crow in Bran's dreams. Whatever Bran did in those dreams, maybe proved he was who they were looking for, but in the version where Blood Raven went into Euron's mind, he failed. Or you could easily see why Blood Raven went into Euron's mind and was like, yikes. It's not this guy. Holy crap. This is dark. Like, let me out I'm get out of here. <laughs> I don't want to be in this man's mind. If this guy's the savior of humanity, God sucks. <laughs> like, what the hell? What is this? <laughs> or George R. R. Martin, you know. <laughs> so uh yeah. You could easily see why they were they noped away from this man's soul if they went went inside and saw that level of darkness. This dude's ready to like murder his own brothers and murder the gods themselves while we're at it. So yeah, so but it but it, the experience is what set him off though. It enabled him. It it put him on that future path of are the gods real or you know can I actually push challenge this? Can I get away with all these things? This will put him on that track in the first place having this vision as a child kind of like how Bran was put on this track that is still pretty early on in walking that path or in his case being carried but whatever uh so can i just say yeah they really pick a new llama before the past llama died I don't know. All I saw was the headline. All I saw the headline was a new Dalai Lama chosen boy in Mongolia. Yeah, I mean, I see that. It says that, that this child was named reincarnation. Anyways, I, I do see that, but I was just. Anyways, the, old, the other one isn't passed yet. It says he's still alive. I looked it up, but there's no. I was like, I didn't remember. How seeing does that work? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Like it doesn't say it's, he's dead. Reincarnation. Right. Anyway, sorry I thought you to had to go die to be reincarnated. That, but yeah, <laughs> anyway. I was so that is. Anyways, I need to read up on this. Clearly, apparently. we all need to learn a little bit more about uh, <laughs> the Dalai yeah. Lama and how that all works. So, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic idea. This is also, I think this is an S-tier theory for me as well, because it's so cool. It's so George. It's while looking for the savior of humanity, they enabled a, perhaps the one that's the most capable of destroying it. Which is awesome <laughs> for a tragedy, considering it's not real. It wouldn't be awesome if it was real. Standard disclaimer, Euron in fiction is great. <laughs> but <laughs> just like Victorian. Not just like Victorian. but <laughs> uh, Ranabir, John in Ghost is going to recreate the story of the rat cook in the night for by eating off people who stabbed him. So this kind of refers back to what Micah was saying about Ghost going after... Uh, the old, old pomegranate. pomegranate, yeah. Wolves, wolves eat fruit, right? Yeah, they eat any food you give them. They're omnivores, yeah. It's not their first choice, but they would eat. Uh, they would eat an old man. I kind of like it. I mean, uh, I, I'm sorry to bring it back to this, but y'all, this kid was named a, 
a different reincarnation of a different Buddhist spiritual leader by the Dalai Lama. Oh. Not he's not the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama, who yes has not died, and they do need anyways. Just just now, y'all know. Are they franchising? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the he's the third most important spiritual leader in Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah, I mean, if you believe in reincarnation, okay. it wouldn't just be the one. Yeah, it wouldn't guy. just be the one that was reincarnated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah true. it yeah. actually makes sense. But anyway, sorry, y'all. I, I this was really interesting to me. Hey, it's it's kind of on topic. We're talking about reincarnation and things like that yeah. coming back, spirits and. Did yeah. this Mongolian boy eat a pomegranate? <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a U.S. born boy who is Mongolian. Oh, okay. Anyway, so yeah. So yeah, I could see that the rat cook. You now, to me, the rat cook story is going to be replayed by it's Walter Frey and, and or Bruce Bolton because the rat cook Manderly has fed the phrase to themselves. And, they, you know, it wasn't Walter Frey who's literally eating his own children. But this it seems like that's already happening in a way. But it, but that doesn't mean that this theory is wrong. It just might not be the rat cook that's being replayed. I could still see Ghost going after some of the people that stabbed John. That part could still happen, regardless of whether it fulfills the Night King or the rat cook uh, story, legend. Um, Steve Van Pruyen says, what are your thoughts about Jon Snow being named Jon Stark as Rob's will could cause? And then does he change his name again after learning his true lineage? Uh, yeah, that's tricky because as far as the name, if Rob's will says he's Jon Stark, which I think it very well could, would Jon accept that name or could he legitimately reject it? Could he reject it? Like if he accepts John, Rob's authority could he even say no to that could he be like yeah I don't want to be John Stark but I am if he says I am I mean that's how the, the show portrayed it I think regardless of how the show portrayed it I think one thing they got right was that John didn't really ever want it he didn't want to be king he didn't really that I feel is clear enough he he rejected John Stark from winter from Stannis not because it didn't feel right, but because he felt like this was his place. He felt like his place was the wall. He's like, this is his job. This is who he is. This is his identity. He's not meant to rule Winterfell. He pictured it, and it didn't seem right. He was like, mm, me, Val. He's like, well, I like that idea. Me and Val, that sounds nice. But, no, nah, it just doesn't seem right. I think my duty is here. And and as much as Stannis wanted him to accept, he kind of respected that, well, Stannis is a guy about duty. And if you see this as your duty, then... Go on and do your duty. And go ahead, Sean. There's also, you know, we talked a little earlier about the idea of Jon Snow. Well, I think we said John is John's true name. Jon Snow is John's true name, too. That's who he thinks. Like, remember, we even get Terry and tell him, like, accept it. You know, people can't use it against you. Like, well, okay, I, I, have a I don't know. For you real quick. Is Ramsey Bolton or Ram is it Ramsey Snow or Ramsey Bolton? Is it his true name, Ramsey Bolton, then? Because that's what he wants to be called. Is that, is that what you're saying? Hmm. Because, like, he grew up. He was always Ramsey Snow, but he wants to be called. Like, his true name to him is then Ramsey Bolton. So, like, I think it's reasonable. The thing is, it, it's a little different. The difference here is a little different. The, <laughs> John's name is more about his identity, like how he feels about himself. Ramsey is looking for an angle to power. He wants his name to be Ramsey so he inherits this land and can tell other people what to do. I, and cetera, I think he wants to be accepted, too. Yeah, I think that yeah. it is I give, to I him. agree. He wants you to know. be accepted, too. I think John also wants to be accepted, too. But he's not going to use his name as part of his way to leverage power over people. Yeah, which I agree. Ramsey might want to be accepted, he but wants he both. wants yeah. that name so that he can leverage he power. He wants both. Yeah. yeah, he wants both. Yeah, I yeah. agree with you that John doesn't care about the name in order to wield power with it or but he does he does maybe care about the identity he certainly didn't feel comfortable being excluded you know he's like i'm a snow not a stark you know and i agree with you to i really agree with you to bring up that conversation with Tyrion. that's it's a very early groundwork by george as to establishing john's identity but there's two ways to look at it as you said it's it's, it's i'm trying to get a little closer to the issue here there's your legal name which gives you legal rights to property and titles which john doesn't necessarily care about and ramsey does but they both also want the acceptance 
of their family. Like, Ramsey identifies as a Bolton. He is a Bolton. He's Bolton blood. But legally speaking, does he have the property rights of a Bolton? Yes, because he's legitimized. But prior to that, maybe not. Probably still dead because he's the only living Bolton. So he would have gotten it anyway. He would have still probably inherited. But that's a side note. Um, like, I think if Rob's will named him Lord of Winterfell and... He is a Stark. I legitimate that or whatever he did. I can imagine John saying something like, Rob can't change who I am. Or, you know, my brother can give me whatever name he wants, but I'm the Lord Commander. Or, I don't know, I can find all kinds yeah. of ways for him to, like, accept it and honor it, but get back to the reality of who he is and what's going on right mm. now. Whereas, and if someone accidentally called him Lord Snow, and in apologies, ah, don't worry about it. Call me Lord Commander. I don't think you would mind. You're right, yeah. Or, but if anyone called Ramsey the wrong name, he'd chop their fingers off or something. You yes, because that would you would see that as an insult. Yeah, I'd be like, you don't call me that. Yeah. I mean, that did happen. Like, he did kill someone. We, we, we even heard about that. He called... He called... There was that just random person on the road that called him... Uh, called him that, and they killed him and took his goats and ate them. It was described... And we didn't see it. It was described off page. But, yeah. So, you, you're totally right. Um... As far as the general chaos that it will cause if Rob's will is when it's revealed, because I do think it will happen. Obviously, it's come after John's been stabbed. So that's he's named a dead man, possibly an undead person to be Lord of Winterfell, which is awkward <laughs> and hard to predict how that will go. But it does also mean maybe technically speaking Sure, they didn't know, but the will was issued before John's stabbing, which could arguably put the old pomegranate and his cohorts up for regicide, you know? <laughs> like, ignorance of the law is not a defense, right? Like, I didn't know. We didn't know he was king. <laughs> but you knew he was Lord Commander. I mean, they still, <laughs> they still, they don't have a, a leg to stand on there, even if, yeah. even if they're even if it's true they didn't know he had been named king i don't, I don't think they would find much uh sympathy from especially given the other points about yes john's friends were in range of all this like leathers and one one are right there and ghost <laughs> and other people so really really i have referred to this scenario as ultra chaotic super hard to predict you have way too many factors you have the will the reaction of people to one one, the reaction of people to John stabbing, the reaction of stu um, the, the wildlings were about to, they were all fired up getting ready to go fight the Boltons. So yeah, we don't need to rehash all that, but it's one of the most dynamic scenarios going on right now uh, in all of the books, and that's saying something. Um, but I do think he will accept the title. I think he has to, It's because it's a duty thing, and he's, he's not going to want to, but yeah. Kirsty Angel says, could opening the lineage book, sends a super chat, by the way, sends, uh, could opening the lineage book, uh, John Aaron read, or the death of John Aaron be the reason for what woke the others? Uh, you mean the book, oh, this is, this refers to the book that looked up, that refers to the seed is all strong, the seed is strong. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the evidence that all these, that the gold always yielded to the coal when Lannister and Baratheon, uh, wed. Um, that's an interesting idea. I've never heard this before. Like the book itself was cursed and that these pages uh, brought back the, I don't know. I've never, I, I'm not aware of a cursed book. And if that is a thing that has been broached, especially as one that's cursed with such a, a severe thing, open this book and the others come back. That's, that's quite a curse. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, going to say day. But I do think there's some symbolic um, framework here but you could point to is the obsession of bloodlines and dynasties and passing property down to a select few within your family and the system of that they live under is it causes these problems. It causes inevitable destruction. It causes inevitable civil war and things like this. It causes the people who are excluded, which you can symbolically look at or metaphorically look at as the others, the ones who were kept out of it all. They come back and bite you in the butt. The revenge of the excluded. Uh, if you keep the if if the rich and powerful keep the the commoners down too long, eventually something breaks. Eventually, there the you can't do that forever. 
from Discord, Blue Fleur. So, is that Blue Fleur? That's like Blue Flower? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That is what that is. The first A Song of Ice and Fire theory I ever read was the Heron Hall Conspiracy. It draws on the Southron Ambitions theory quite a bit, which itself is pretty mainstream, but I love the way it lays out the timeline leading up to Robert's Rebellion and the political explanation for why Rhaegar chased after Lyanna. Yeah, so basically the idea is that Southron Ambitions theory, the, the simple version is that there was... Uh, Ned's father, Rickard, was marrying into the South, was playing, in, getting involved in Southern politics. And it's interesting. One of the reasons this is interesting is because this, the North had mostly just stayed out of Southern politics for so long. We've seen this over and over. We're talking about the Blackfire Billions or the Dance of the Dragons. Either they're involved late or not at all, or their involvement is uncertain after the fact. Usually they just stay out of it. Uh, so that alone is reason to wonder, like, why was Rickard getting involved? Why was he marrying his his children to these southern lords and getting involved in this power block that was opposed to the traditional Targaryen power block? Uh, now, of course, some of the reasons it makes sense is that the Targaryens were actually behind it, or Rhaegar was actually behind it. He was working to form a coalition that could overthrow his father somewhat peacefully, or at least overwhelmingly present such strength that they wouldn't want to fight back. Look, five of the seven great houses are on my side. Do you really want like those other two great houses might just give up? Be like, okay, we're not going to fight two on five here. And Ares could yell and scream and order the burnings of whoever. And they would just be like, sorry, dude, you lost. You're out, you know, time to abdicate. And so Rhaegar may have, in, that, that makes a lot of sense because it, it, Rhaegar would have wanted to do this bloodlessly. Why would he want a civil war? Like who, you know, it doesn't fit his character at all. It doesn't fit anything, he, any of his designs or any of his, the prophecies. None of that works. It's just something that happened that he, like an unintended consequence of, of trying to fulfill the theories and trying to fulfill the prophecies. So uh, calling it the Harrenhal conspiracy is... Part of the idea that is the, the the finger of all this. It's like a hand full of theories here. Is the finger? This part of it is that they met at Heron Hall in order to have a place and to meet in person that wouldn't look suspicious. Varus, nevertheless, called it suspicious <laughs> to Ares, and that's why Ares went, which was a surprise. Everyone was like, "Oh, Ares is actually leaving the Red Keep," which. That's part of why they thought this would work, because Ares hadn't left the Red Keep in so long because he was so paranoid. But he was so paranoid that he did leave the Red Keep. It kind of backfired, in a sense. Um, backfire is a funny metaphor to use for Ares, but <laughs> he's more front fire. Front, side, left. All fire in all directions from that guy. So there's a lot here. And this is something that I do expect we will learn more about. Certain people know some things. They will reveal them. We'll get a little closer to this idea, but it makes sense. We know Rhaegar wanted to do away with his father, not kill him, but he was entertaining the idea. He maybe didn't do it quickly enough. We know that he was probably arranged the tournament. It was probably to meet with these lords. We know Rickard and Hoster Tully and John Aaron were, were tight and then later even tighter. So much of it makes sense. They lost their leader, the guy they were going to back in the long run with Rhaegar, and then had to pivot to Robert or because of what Ares did and Rhaegar sided with them. Things so At some point, this alliance fell apart because of what happened to the Starks or maybe some other reason, but it certainly <laughs> that certainly didn't help it if it hadn't already fallen apart. So, yeah, it's, it's rich and big and, and worthy of an entire episode or more, uh, not just me. Uh, expounding on it here for a few minutes but it's 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 awesome i wonder by the way if there is a chance that liana was a monkey wrench to the prophecy or Rhaegar's plans or whatever kind of like uh oh shoot rob's wife i can't remember her name but jane westerling or talisa in the show yeah um that you know he there was this master plan to uh, ally with the phrase and a uh, overcome the Lannisters and da da da, but he just fell in love with a girl and that just for better or worse became a bigger priority for him than these other commitments that he had. 
I wonder if that could have happened with Rhaegar and Lyanna, that it wasn't necessarily part of some prophecy or some, you know, you know, I'll say, Sean, I think it's possible again. I'll say my, uh, it, it, they're not mutually exclusive. Rhaegar could have thought it was a prophecy and chosen her and done, all that could be true. And then he could have and still also fell in love, love with her. her. And yeah, it was absolutely. all ruined yeah. for that. You know what I mean? Like uh, those two things can coexist. Cause he was obviously deep in theory crafting and prophecy stuff before he even met Liana. So it could have been like, oh, her, she fulfills this. Wow. Oh, she's, you know, a child of the North. And then, yeah, then he met her. Cause he was, if she was the Knight of the Laughing Tree, we know Ares sent Rhaegar to go hunt this person down. If he found out who she was, was just impressed with her. Was like, oh my God, you are, you are all that. <laughs> and so it just clicked for him. Like, boy, I, I love you and you're <laughs> a, in my dreams, uh, prophetic dreams. Yeah. Big stuff. And we talked about like the overconfidence of him charging Robert at the at the Trident, but it was a little overconfident of him to name her the Queen of Love and Beauty at the tournament too, right? <laughs> like mm. just publicly in front of everyone to do this very, I don't know, non-standard taboo, controversial thing. He, I think that was more overconfident than going after Robert. <laughs> right on. Okay. Uh, next one we have from... Brandolin, who says, Brand the Builder and the children used warging to enslave the giants to build the wall, so it's got all the blood magic curse stuff places like Harrenal have, and it's why Mel feels stronger there. I am a proponent of this theory. We talk about it in our uh, Brand and the Builder episode and our patrons only The Buildings of Brandon episode, which is done in conjunction with Crowfood's daughter. Good stuff. There is suggestion of this that, yes, Giants helped Brandon the Builder uh, in general. Uh, he may, Their help may not have been willing. And if it was unwilling, then magical means would make sense to control them because how else do you control giants? I mean, they, they're they so big. And, like, what would inf what would get them to do your will if not magic? Like, I don't suppose putting them in chains would like just break the chains and walk. I'm like, okay, I'm going to leave now. <laughs> See ya. Or I'll attack you. So I, I feel like magic's the only way to control giants other than agree with them. Just come to an accord and, you know, do like one, one and, you know, Hey, you will give you food and shelter and you help us build. Like that's possible too. In the episode, there's an, I refer to the case of Sandor and Arya where Sandor helps the villagers build a wall and then he's kicked out afterwards. He's not afforded the protection it gives from the coming storm of war in the Riverlands and progressively worsening scenario of more and more broken men being out there. And not to mention they were being attacked by clansmen from the nearby Vale who were now armed with steel and iron thanks to Tyrion. So Things have gotten a lot more dangerous around there, and they it kind of sounds like what was happening in the ancient north. Things were getting dangerous. They're worried about what could happen. They worried the others could return. So they built a gigantic wall and then kicked the giants out. It's like, you guys do not get to live under the protection of this thing because we're scared of you and or whatever reason, but they weren't included. And yeah, it, it seems to symbolically fit. There's suggestion of it in the text. The, even the maesters entertain the idea that the giants didn't work willingly, but it's a, it's a possible, it's an, it's an open question because they, there's a lot of reasons why they could have just helped. On the other hand, if they had helped, why did they not end up on, you know, they, they got, maybe got screwed out of it somehow. Cause somehow they ended up on the other side of the wall after helping build. Maybe it. they were happy to keep these humans out of their land. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll help you build this wall and stay out. <laughs> I like it. They're like, we're helping them build a wall. But actually, <laughs> our real goal is to, yeah, build a fence to protect us from them. It does I make sense. I call it a fence uh, for a them. Fence. Yeah, for them. It's just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nina doesn't love the idea to give pushback here, to give an alternate take. She doesn't think the giants, she says, well, the giants have just as much reason to fear the others as the humans do. So why would they need to be enslaved to this? They would more likely be willingly helpful. So she's open, I guess, to the idea of them being screwed by it afterwards. Like, no, you, you, you helped us build this, but you know you don't get to live here. And that's more like the way humans behave. Like, we're willing to use people or other things and then throw them aside. 
Not I'm using the royal we, not we individuals. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a lot of room here, but it may, it may just be one of those things that is a rumor because born of the fact that it's born of ignorance, born of how could humans have built that tall without the help of giants, right? Well, with cranes and levers and pulleys and <laughs> how do they build the high tower? Like there's, yeah, maybe there was magic and giants involved. Like you can't say there wasn't, but we don't need that explanation. Humans are pretty amazing with building. We are, we have buildings that tall in the real world without giants. And they were built a long, 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 long time ago. Like the pyramids, for example. And in the real world, we are in, we must deal with aliens built the pyramids. You know, nonsense <laughs> like yeah. that. It's the same kind of thing, except that in this, in the books, it actually does fit to suggest magic warging because those things do exist we're like yeah aliens built the pyramid i don't know about that i can't say aliens don't exist but why that yeah never mind <laughs> let's not get into that uh actually, it's not like this is a theories episode or anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a westeros theories idea not a ancient <laughs> egypt theories episode Ashes, dollar sign, Ashes, dollar sign says, Tyrion will find Bright Roar and he'll help him gain support in the West, reclaiming Casterly Rock. Well, it would help. I mean, I don't know that he needs that much help. I think his support he needs is just manpower, which he seems to be acquiring through the Second Sons and, you know, getting rid of his other family members that stand in his way and have a better claim. And being able to take out Casterly Rock from the inside. Yeah. With his knowledge of the of the sewers system and all that yeah i mean i do think it would be cool if he had it it would maybe give him a little leg up but it, i don't think he i don't think it would make a difference like he's he's definitely a lannister no one's Sizes. questioning his lannisteritude he doesn't need a leg up <laughs> <laughs> uh also this sword is like taller than him yeah i mean it's probably taller than me <laughs> yeah i don't think he'd be wielding it yeah, no, I don't think so. It's a, it's a great sword, so it might be six feet long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I kind of want Bright Roar to appear because it would be cool. But, yeah, I don't think Tyrion needs, needs uh, it. And I think we don't need like to get into it. I think we should keep a quicker pace for some of these. I'm just, That's just me as producer going to get in and say, hey, let's go quicker with some. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, we're not going to – we're definitely not going to – we can't get to all these theories. We have tons of theories that people yeah. submitted new, and we haven't even gotten to any of the new theories yet. Well, let me skip ahead to the one that I wanted to talk about most, because we haven't gotten to that one yet. Okay. And Perfect. then we'll probably call it a day, because we're mm -hmm. maybe do one or two more. But we have enough left to save for another time, Yeah. especially if we add some more. We knew we wouldn't get to all of them. That's just always the case. You all are great. You send us so many awesome theories, but the only downside is that we can't get to them all. Not much of a downside, really. Can't get to them all in one episode. Yeah, we'll do a part We could get three. to them all eventually. Yeah. yeah. So well, the, the, part three probably won't be as soon as this one was from part one, and we'll we'll, we'll try to work on our format and make it a little more yeah. cool. The, the tiers Tiered. thing. That'll be fun. Yeah, well, we'll do our tier list. But anyway, here's the one I was really excited to talk about. Actually, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> was it in the news section? Uh, no, it is not in the news section. Oh. It is the one about the kindly man and Varus. Oh, I see that one right. Yeah, I know. Where is that? Uh, is, uh, right here. It's Jeff Stern. Varus is the kindly man. Okay, I don't even need to see it. Okay, yeah. so the theory is that Je that Varus is the kindly man. And the evidence for this is that so many things the kindly man does or says is very similar to the way Varus behaves, acts, talks, etc. I like the detail notice. I like that you've noticed these details here. I don't agree with the conclusion of them being the same person. But the reason I love this idea so much is that I've, I'm a, a big proponent of Varus being undermined, even potentially killed by Arya. Because Arya's arc has long been following in a lot of the same footsteps Varus fell in. That he grew up under. Being separated from his family gone through a horrible running around and being just one step ahead of the slavers in Varus's case and, and eventually hooking up with a troop, an uh, uh, acting troop, learning all these things about disguise and how to talk differently and to pretend to be somebody else 
<laughs> and Arya's done all this on steroids. Like, she has all that, but with the magic added in. Like, with skin changing and faceless man techniques that Varus doesn't seem to have. He's just a, ex a regular old master of disguise. Like, he's Kaiser Soze. You know, he's that. He's just an expert at the, the mundane version of that. There doesn't seem to be any magic around Varus at all. In fact, he kind of rejects it, whether that's honest or not when he says that i tend to believe he is because i don't see why he would need to lie to Tyrion about that it, no one's gonna think he's on stannis's side anyway and that's why he brought it up he's like oh i'm against stannis because stannis uses magic and that means i'm totally everybody knows why Varus is against stannis anyway like stannis didn't like Varus, like so he doesn't need to invent reasons to be anti-stannis it's it's pretty clear already <laughs> so <clears throat> Mm. I so, like Amy Collins Russell points out that Arya's even been with mummers like Varys was. <laughs> exactly. She's learned the same techniques from similar people, but better because she's uh, more, I don't know, she's more capable in a lot of ways, not just because of the magic. She's maybe learning it at a younger age. Oh, she's already been down in the tunnels in the Red Keep, which Varus is the master of at this point. He's, of as far as anyone who lives right now, the guy who knows those tunnels and uses them the most, gets the most benefit from them, is him. So basically, you're saying, Aziz, you don't think Varus is the kindly man, but you liked, the, you liked that this was brought up because you think Arya was trained by the kindly man and is going to kill Varys. Be that's why those similarities exist. That's why the parallels to Varus and the kindly man exist, because the parallels are there for Arya to s overcome Varus you at his own game. Mm -hmm. She's already been down in the tunnels. She's already can warg into cats. The cats were what enabled her to see down there or w could enable her to see in the darkness down there, which she's already done while blind. She's seen through a cat's eyes. And that's how she got down in the tunnels in the first place, by following a cat. And that's how it's enabled her to stumble on Varus and Hilario amongst the dragon skulls. Maybe rather than it's something that's setting her up to overcome Varus, maybe it's setting her up to see the same thing as Varus. Maybe she's going to follow his same path and come to the same conclusion. And they're yeah, going to. I could see that. But, but here's another. Here's a reason why I think she will want to kill him. She finds out what he's been doing with these children. It's, it's almost straightforward. Like he's been using child slaves cutting their tongues out and doing all this awful stuff. Yeah, maybe, I mean, yeah, he's doing it for the greater good, according to him. Arya's not going to see it that way, I don't think. I don't think Arya's going to be like, oh, yeah, he's doing it for the greater good. <laughs> no, she's going to have a much more black and white, eh, house of black and white view of it. Like, <laughs> nope, child slaver, you must die, period, <laughs> you know? And... She has all the tools to overcome him because she's she knows his tunnels, she knows his haunts, she knows his methods. She she's not going to be fooled by his disguises either. She will totally out him if she sees him in disguise. She's like, oh, that's I know all the techniques a person uses to conceal their name. That's not his real walk. That's an, she just she can undermine almost everything he does in terms of disguise and subterfuge and all that. So it's super cool. All her training points to her being the anti virus and. Also, I think that's going to be part of what comes to a head for her at the House of Fa House of Black and White. She's going to have a falling out with the with with them, with the Faceless Men, and uh, because of maybe similar things that they're not all on the up and up. After all, maybe she'll discover that they're working with the Iron Bank, that they're funneling loot to them, that they're not all they claim to be. They've become a corrupt organization over time, just like so many other organizations inevitably do. A lot of reasons for Arya to turn on them because she has a very stark sense of justice that if the truth comes out, she's going to see that they're not what they say they are and she's not going to be cool with that. Just like she wasn't cool with what her own father did to Micah and Lady. She's like, that wasn't justice. Like she she wasn't fooled by that. She she didn't get why Ned had to yield to the politics of the situation. She never accepted that. She just she thought it was unjust and she still sees it that way. So yeah, this is a lot here. It's from Arya being the the cat person, from Arya having the tunnel expertise to the disguise stuff, to the magic stuff, to just the fact that she's gonna, if she ever finds out what he's doing, he'll probably go on the list. He's not on the list right now, to be fair, but Cersei is. <laughs> so she has reason to go to the Red Keep. 
you know, and maybe this along the way, other things happen. She figures this other stuff out. She's seen Varus before, obviously, in his disguise before she was good at sussing out disguises. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think I've said enough for now. Yes. Uh-huh. But that's uh, it's pretty <laughs> good. Pretty good. It's a rich, rich vein of, of theory there. Okay, so yeah, we have many theories we still didn't get to. Thank you all for sending those in. Apologize we couldn't get them today. I'm sure you y'all were hoping if you had a theory submitted, especially if you submitted a theory to, to number one, and we still haven't gotten to it. We didn't, other than this Ari one, <laughs> we haven't really gone out of order. We've pretty much- We still haven't gone out of order. That, uh, the, uh, that, that one that you just went into was an emailed one. No, I'm saying, uh, but I jumped ahead a little uh, bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You jumped ahead two questions. Oh, is that all? Okay. Literally well, two questions and not even to new questions. We have a whole other section. Oh, I know. I knew it was an old one. Today. Yeah, I'm just saying that um, we, we're going in order slightly with a, one slight exception on the order we you all sent these in. So apologize if your theory hasn't gotten to yet, but we will. We'll get to it. Yeah, we crossed out the ones we got to and the ones that we haven't gotten to will just make the document for part three. Feel free to send us more. We'll we'll get to them when we can. And if not, just wait till the next call goes out for more theories. We will certainly take care of that. It's always fun to talk theories. It's nice to go all over the place. We get to talk about Starks in one minute. And we're talking about symbolic analysis of pomegranates the next. And <laughs> going to Ashai the next. And the Dothraki Sea. And the Basilisk Isle. Yeah, I like these kind of episodes because we get to jump all over the place and and put our fingers in a lot of pies all in one episode hot pie would be proud i think that we covered uh, around 30 on the first one and this one oh, and okay. we have less than 30 left so the next time we should get to all of them we've gotten so far cool yeah, i'm get sure to all of them more, and but... if we're doing two we have to actually go back through old ones the yeah. best ones you know <laughs> that's a little bit different we'll just figure out that that's true but thank you very much for sending your three we really appreciate the participation as well as the the patients for the people who who haven't gotten theirs entered yet, and for people who were able to come, even though we weren't doing our scheduled episode, which yeah. was going to be Bail or the Blessed, that one date TBD, but it won't be the the earliest that could possibly be is April sixteenth. Yeah, uh, well, it, it's more likely to be in May, but we'll see. We'll we'll let y'all know when it happens. The trivia question: the answer the 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 question was who. Did the cartoony trope of sniffing pepper than sneezing salad or son? And in fact, what's weird about this? There's only two sneezes in the entire series. (laughs) There's lots of coughing. There's wheezing, but there's only two sneezes. Arya sneezes. And it's what, and she's sneezing so badly that the hound is like, all right, we got to go find shelter because she's getting a cold from riding around in the rain. And the other one is this, Case of the Pepper, where Salador San <laughs> is like, these, uh, he's complaining that there were only 43 barrels of pepper. He's like, what, I think we're not counting? I <laughs> think we're not counting the pepper and, and testing it? And then he opens one up. He's like, sneeze, you know. <laughs> like, yep, that's real pepper, all right. <laughs> so, uh, what was your favorite part of this episode? What did you find most insightful or funny? Maybe you had a favorite theory that we discussed or a favorite Sean, answer. Sean, get a cat. Let us know. And, you don't have to tell me twice. And you might get a shout out. Of course, you could also just send us your theories and that eventually will get read aloud as well. Lots of ways to get mentioned on an episode of History of Westeros podcast. Also, we appreciate those of you who support us on sites like Patreon or Spotify. You can do a recurring subscription. Choose the amount you want to send per month. And it just auto bills every month at that time. We give you, in exchange for that support, we give you things like access to our scripts, access to our notes, access to bonus episodes, which is by far the best uh, benefit to signing up. Some of the benefits are only available on Patreon. The bonus episodes are available on either site, Spotify or Patreon. And you can also send us straight donations through historyofwesteros.com. If you do that, we will send you the links manually to all of our bonus episodes both the video and uh, audio links so and pretty good bang for your buck there oh uh, we have a cat here we also got a super chat i can't put it in the document because my keyboard won't work right now but oh. uh brandolin price just sent a super chat and said thanks for another great episode thanks for a theory submission and hey, yeah thank you brandolin for being a very active part of our chats and, and always sending us good questions and uh, lots of good comments we appreciate that it's very motivating we are we've been doing this for a long time you may not think that 
feedback means a lot to us, but it really does. We are, you know, this is an entertainment job and uh, we care about what y'all think both as in terms of how we produce our episodes, but also just as people we like, we, we like being liked, you know, <laughs> we're human. We're not deep ones. We're not others. We're not. Uh... I'm a pretty deep one. She's pretty deep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's the deep one of all of us. Yeah. Me and Sean are the shallow ones. <laughs> we grow big beards to hide I mean, our you said shallowness. It, I didn't, so. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So thanks as well to Nina. Uh, we'll have her back on for real for Baylor the Blessed, but she also had some written in some, some answers, her own responses to some of these questions, which was very helpful because I like to have lots of takes. Lots of variety. We don't always agree. So it's good to have, um, you know, variety of uh, ways to look at these things. And maybe you pick which one you like best. Yeah, I'm excited for our next episode on Craig and Stark. Yep. Old Man in the North. We will not have Sean next week. So it will be a spoilery episode. Um, that is the silver lining to a Seanless episode. <laughs> is that we can be a little looser with what we talk about with regards to what's to come in House of the Dragon slash Fire and Blood. And that's the only place we really need to be concerned about spoilers these days. Sean has read everything except Fire and Blood. So we're not worried about spoilers for anything else. But still, it's fun to have you unsullied for fire for this TV show. And you 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 you've had takes that we wouldn't have thought of because of that. So it's been invaluable. Lots of the feedback reflects that as well. So we're, we're gonna keep that going as well as we can. It's hard to stay unsullied, but not too hard. You know, it's not like people are just throwing spoilers at you left and right. But we do have to be cautious. Thanks as well to Joey, Jesse, and Bran for our music and intros. Michael Klarfeld for our other video intro and for the maps you see behind me, the known world. I like how this map in our, a lot of our YouTube shorts, it shows up as just the known. I'm sitting under the known and it just makes me sound like I'm some sort of authority figure. I'm the known. <laughs> not really. Like I said, it makes me seem that way. Hmm. <laughs> it's all smoking me. It's all Varus disguise. So there's an Arya waiting to undermine me and prove who I really am. Let's see who you really are. It's like a Scooby-Doo. Pull the mask off. I don't know what's under this. I got no... I, the joke ends there. I, I didn't think this through. The unknown. The unknown, yeah. <laughs> who watches... A white walker. Yeah, who watches the... Your shirt refers to... Yeah, that's... There we go. Who watches the Azizes? Okay, everybody. We'll be back next week with the old man. More fun stuff and more good times. We'll keep it going as always. Even when we have to pivot, we still got good stuff for you. Thanks again, everybody. You know what to do. Valar, re-read us.